Okay, um, I put out a notification. So yeah, we've got ins up here, we've also got fish here, and uh, the topic that they wanna talk about, we tried to get an exact proposition, but um, that was a little difficult, we're not 100% sure exactly where the disagreement is. So the topic is just gonna be the use of explanationism to evaluate theories and objections to the interpretation argument. So uh, unless you guys, uh, unless one of you is set on going first, um, we can just like, you know, flip a coin or something if that works. One of you guys want to call heads or tails? Um, I, I don't even, like, Joe, what's your position? Can you just lay out your view on this? Because I don't know how much Joe agrees with Vic. So I want to, I would like to know what his overall opinion on this. You there, Joe? Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yeah. I don't know why it wasn't working the first time. So, um, yeah, I, I think one of the things is to clarify, I think that there's a more rigorous way of talking about falsifiability that undermines a lot of the issues. Um, mm -hmm. and it might be the case that you disagree with me, um, after you hear it. Okay, well, go ahead and, uh, tell me. That's all right. Okay, so, uh, Vic was giving this idea of, uh, falsifiability that some people think is, uh, too absolute, right? Um, and the idea is, uh, a minimum requirement for an explanation of our observations is that it can be, I'm going to term it disconfirmable. You're going to be able to identify evidence that would be um, counter to your hypothesis. That is, if you can have evidence for it, right? Like you want to say there are states of affairs that if we observe them would raise the probability of our hypothesis being true. Well, to disconfirm such a hypothesis, you would just, I, identify states of affairs that would um, go against your hypothesis, that would uh, lower the probability of it being true. And I think that um, if that's the case, right, it's it seems like uh, for anything to be on the table uh, to explain any set of evidence, it has to be disconfirmable. Um, otherwise, you can't appeal to explanatory virtues in order to uh, tease out which is the best uh, hypothesis if both hypotheses are, um, you know, you can't disconfirm them. So does that make sense so far? Yeah, well, I just, yeah, that makes sense. So what Vic was saying was that if an explanation isn't falsifiable, if it can't be disconfirmed in the way that you said, then it's just not rational to accept that explanation. That's just a, a kind of absolute for him. For him. Right. So uh, I think that if we're talking about empirical explanations, right, trying to explain our observations, then I would agree with him. It You should be able to um, disconfirm them. Otherwise, uh, you're not going to be able to say that there's any evidence that, that um, could be for your hypothesis. And so if there's no evidence, then it's not even on the table for you to evaluate it using explanatory virtues. Now, uh, conceptually, uh, there are plenty of things that are unfalsifiable that um, we can argue about, right? Like plenty of accounts of meta-ethics or uh, just like views on dualism, et cetera, that, uh, you know, you can argue about uh, and they're unfalsifiable, but I just think that's a different category, right? That's a category where you wouldn't really apply explanatory virtues, explanatory virtues, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, this was the discussion that I was having about with Vic was about theism, right? But theism isn't an empirical claim. So how does, um, how does the, the falsifiability requirement apply to theism when it's not an empirical claim? Well, the the thing to 
distinguish is that usually the argument is against theistic explanations. They're explanations that appeal to God, not necessarily just theism explains it, right? So the ex explanation for uh, the existence of the universe would be that there's a, uh, you know, a divine agent that uh, wanted to create the universe. That would be a theistic explanation. Um, but it's not that it's just merely um, God exists, therefore that's an explanation. Do you see the distinction? Yeah, sure. So you would agree with me that that isn't an empirical claim, right? That God exists and that he wanted to create the universe. That's more like dualism or meta ethics. That's a metaphysical claim. Well, uh, the thing with like a theistic explanation is uh, I do think that there are people who do want to say that you can uh, answer things empirically by appealing to theism, right? Like people want to explain, uh, people argue over the evidential problem of evil, for example. The theistic explanation uh, varies from the different theodicies that they use to explain away uh, all the all the observations of gratuitous evil, right? It seems like that's haggling over empirical uh, facts about the world, and so um, it it is in the realm of like a it is in the realm where you would talk about explanatory virtues and you would compare it to competing empirical. Um, explanations. Sure. So empirical evidence can certainly be brought to bear on theism, right? And it can also be brought to bear on dualism, but that doesn't turn dualism in or theism into a um, an empirical claim itself, right? That explanation is still a metaphysical one. It's just that you can use empirical observation as evidence for it. Hmm. Well, I uh... Think about it in terms of this. It's there's different domains of reasoning: inductive, uh, deductive, and abductive. If you want to uh, have something, you want to have an, a reason abductively for accepting theism, then you would uh, you would approach it the way I just described by saying that the best explanation for our observations of gratuitous or of just the suffering in the world would be that there's a god that created a world um who desired uh agents with libertarian free will to inhabit that world for example that would be a theistic that would be a hypothesis that theists it seems to me would want to support as an explanation for our observations of suffering around the world yeah it's an explanation for that for that explanandum but it's still a metaphysical explanation Um, so I'm not, I'm not really sure. I, the thing is, is that, are you saying that as a consequence, we could still put it up against other explanations, even though it would be unfalsifiable? Well, yeah, you started by saying that it's just your view that any empirical hypothesis has got to be falsifiable, but, um, the theistic hypothesis isn't an empirical hypothesis. So I just don't see why the requirement would apply. I mean, it just seems like uh, it needs to make predictions, right? The idea is that if the god desires agents with libertarian free will, then we can say what we would expect to see. And uh, that makes it so it's actually constrained. That makes it so it is disconfirmable. Well, it might not be disconfirmable, right? It might just be that there's things that are more likely on theism. Theism is just a simpler explanation than other our other explanations, right? Could be that all of our explanations are empirically equivalent. But there's still other explanatory virtues to appeal to, like coherence with background beliefs and so forth. Right. So the the issue is is that I feel like theism will just lose every time because we have plenty of uh alternative hypotheses that uh not only uh, cohere with our background knowledge and uh, have other explanatory virtues, but uh, they make predictions that we can test and that are confirmed. 
which is something that the theistic mm -hmm. explanation doesn't do. And so it, it just, uh, de facto, you would always have theistic explanations fail if you're insisting on them always being unfalsifiable. Yeah, so I agree that um, non-theistic explanations are better. Like, I'm not a theist, but the thing is, is that that's a shift from what you and Vic kind of started with, right? What you said is that since theism is just unfalsifiable, it's just off the table. It's just ruled out. But what you just said there was a bit different. You said, well, actually, theism just isn't a very good explanation because we have better explanations. You see that that's a different claim? Right, so, so if you just say theism is you know, not a good explanation compared to its alternatives, I'd be on board with that. But it's this, it's this idea that we can just rule out theism because it's unfalsifiable that I take issue with. So do you have some kind of reply? He's probably having that issues. Okay. Hey, can you guys hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Did you hear what I said, or do you just want me to repeat myself? No, I, I heard what you said. Uh, okay. So there's kind of two things. One of them is uh, I just think that, look, uh, in an abductive context, you're saying that you have competing hypotheses for a set of evidence. So you're already assuming that they're disconfirmable. Right off the bat, then you would just dismiss theistic uh, explanations. They're off the table. They wouldn't compete. But then I was saying that even if you did like insist on you know putting them into this uh you know putting this them into this competition with rival hypotheses, again they're just going to fail because uh, the predictions that they make uh, uh, they flunk the test. Right, we're unable to test the the theistic hypotheses, whereas we're able to test rival hypotheses. Well, that's one explanatory virtue that other hypotheses have, right? But, you know, it's, potentially, it's conceivable that there could be a theistic explanation that was just way higher in other explanatory virtues. I mean, they're called explanatory virtues for a reason, right? They're not explanatory requirements. Um, now, there are many other explanations that people believe in that just are unfalsifiable, right? So one that I brought up with Vic was multiverse theories. Uh, there's no way to test a multiverse theory. We can't get outside the universe and check if there's other multiverses or something like that. We just posit the multiverse because it explains things like the fine tuning of the universe, for instance. Right. It sounds like you're you're describing what would be ontological economy. But the thing is, is that uh, you there's ways that you can show that there's evidence against there being a multiverse. And so uh, that's all I'm asking for. It seems like a minimum requirement to say that you have to be able to identify evidence that would go against your hypothesis if you then want to start applying other explanatory virtues to it. But uh, by saying that it's unfalsifiable, 
you're admitting, you're conceding that there is no evidence for the hypothesis. So it wouldn't compete at all. Well, if by evidence, do you mean observation, observational evidence? Any uh, any state of affairs, any observation, facts, whatever that would uh, that um, if true would raise the probability of the hypothesis being true. Yeah, right. But the thing is, is that um, that's not the only thing that we use to choose theories, right? Like coherence with background beliefs isn't an observation; it's conceptual. Um, simplicity is no observation either; it's conceptual, right? No, but the idea is that you use explanatory virtues to adjudicate between uh, hypotheses that are compatible with the evidence. Like if you already say um, X hypothesis and Y hypothesis, are, um, the probability of them being true is raised by this set of facts. Then you start appealing to the explanatory virtues of those hypotheses to see which is the best one. X hypothesis might be more simple, for example, than Y hypothesis. So we should prefer that um, explanation if you know simplicity is one of the explanatory virtues we desire in our explanation. Yeah, so that doesn't mean just because you can do that, that doesn't mean that the theory has got to be falsifiable, right? It might be completely unfalsifiable. Like you said that apparently there are ways to falsify multiverse theories. I don't know how that would work exactly considering we can't get outside of our own universe, right? How, uh, could you explain um, how that's possible? Um, I think that it's explained in this one article, but are you, you're saying that there couldn't be evidence uh, against there being a multiverse? Yeah, how could we have evidence for that? Well, then I just don't see how it would, how you would even have it compete with uh, rival hypotheses. Because it explains things. Yeah, but if it doesn't, if it, if it, if there can't be evidence for it, what does it explain? It explains the explanandum. Okay, so that's the facts to be explained. But if yeah. it doesn't predict those facts, then, then like, how can you say it's an explanation of well, it? it? It does predict those facts. It's just that it's equally compatible with any other set of facts, right? So it does explain the facts in a trivial sense. It's just that we can't say that there are that are more or less likely on the multiverse theory, and then look for those facts to try and raise the probability of the theory or lower the probability of the theory, making it unfalsifiable. Yeah, but if it's unfalsifiable, like all the facts are consistent with it. Exactly. But it can still explain the explanandum. And there might be other explanatory virtues that it has, and that's actually what physicists will use to decide on multiverse theories. They'll look at things like coherence with background beliefs, explanatory scope, simplicity, and so forth. So they're offering it up as an explanation for uh, cosmology, right? Yeah, but it, it, it's not as though we can say, oh, this piece of evidence disconfirms it, because the multiverse theory is compatible with any observation. I mean, what are the predictions of the multiverse theory? Well, it, it doesn't make any predictions, right? Then I just don't even see how it would be considered science. So, phys so modern physics is bullshit, basically. No, I mean, I'm asking what would make it so it would still compete with other um, hypotheses. Because it explains the explanandum. Um, what explanandum? Say the fine tuning of the universe. But it would also explain a coarsely tuned universe. Yep. So that wouldn't raise the probability of the multiverse hypothesis being true. Well, the observation doesn't, right? But there are conceptual virtues that it has, which would lead a physicist to believe in it. Yeah, but uh, the issue is that the conceptual virtues are applied in order to adjudicate between hypotheses that are compatible for the same hypotheses. So if it only explained like a, a universe that's finely tuned, then we would have it compete with other explanations, uh, right? But the issue is that it, it's compatible with all states of affairs. 
So it doesn't explain anything. It wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't even apply these other explanatory explanatory virtues to it in order to try to adjudicate between uh, the other hypotheses that it's competing against. It wouldn't even be in the competition because the competition is about what hypothesis explains the evidence. But if the ev all the evidence is uh, compatible with the hypothesis, then it, like you, you're not raising the probability of it being true by pointing to it. The, the thing to be explained is the fine tuning of the universe, right? We might think it's improbable that the universe is finely tuned. And we say, well, what explains this, right? Now, one explanation is to say, well, there's an infinite amount of universes. So actually, the probability that there's a finely tuned universe is one, right? So that, uh, that explains the explanandum. But the thing is, is that that would be compatible with any observation. We could be observing a non-finely tuned universe, and the, the multiverse theory could still be true, right? Because multiverse theory predicts that there are going to be not finely tuned universes yeah so I, I just don't see I just don't see the problem here um it explains the explanation and the fact that it isn't falsifiable means nothing um how would you uh, how would you decide between the multiverse you know, um, hypothesis that you just described and the invisible monkey hypothesis, because that's consistent with uh, there being a finely tuned universe and with a coarsely tuned universe. So j just describe the invisible monkey hypothesis, please. There's an invisible monkey that uh, created the multiverse. So God? That's just theism. No, it's an invisible monkey. It, but it created the universe, right? So it's got to be really powerful. Um, sure. Right, and because it created the multiverse, it had to be outside of the multiverse in order to create it, right? It couldn't be in the multiverse, then create the multiverse. That would be a contradiction. So it's got to be a non-spatio-temporal thing. We're talking about an unembodied mind. Right, how would you differentiate that between well, hang on, Joe, you said that You said that that wasn't theism, that's just theism. I mean, that's, I mean, you could say God, but I think it's an invisible monkey. I mean, we well, can actually, a that's a good point, Joe, too. Stop. How, do you, how do you compare, how do you compare uh, a theistic explanation to the multiverse explanation? Wait, Joe, I want to stick on this point, okay? You said it's an invisible monkey. It can't be a monkey because it's not physical. Monkeys are physical. This is a, this is God. This is an unembodied mind we're talking about. Right, no, I'm that? fine. I'm I'm fine with it just uh, secretly being God. I'm asking you now. How does the I mean how how do you differentiate between this theistic explanation and the multiverse explanation? Yeah, well, we just look at the uh, the, va the virtues, right? So maybe um, the theistic explanation doesn't cohere with certain background beliefs. Maybe a background belief that we have is that in order to have a mind, you have to have a brain, right? Well, in that case, that wouldn't the theistic explanation wouldn't cohere. But the multiverse explanation wouldn't have that problem. So that's one. I see. So you're, you're working with just the a priori right now. The idea that you're pointing out is that you can't uh, posit an explanation if it's uh, already self-contradictory, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So I still think that that's, uh, that's not in the realm of like an empirical, like um you know, haggling over hypotheses, right? It seems like it's a necessary requirement for an explanation to not be self-contradictory before you can even uh, say that it's an explanation of our observations. Well, it's not exactly contradictory, right? Like our background belief that in order to have a mind, you have to have a body isn't a priori. That's an empirical um, belief theory that we have right, based on our evidence. So. Maybe there are other explanatory virtues of theism that raise it, you know, that make it better than the multiverse theory, such that that particular deficit is overcome, and we can say, well, um, actually, as it turns out, there is a mind without a body. There's at least one because there's God. So it wouldn't be that it's contradictory. It's just that it doesn't cohere. That, that's not the same thing as a, a, a contradiction. Does it cohere with what? It doesn't cohere with our background belief that in order to have a mind, you have to have a body. Right, so that, that seems like you can identify, I mean, that just seems like another way you can show that there might be evidence against a hypothesis. 
Yeah, but it's still unfalsifiable, right? Because there's no way for me to check whether God's there or not. No, you've Normally. already. No, the the thing is that um, you've already identified a way that it could be falsifiable. Uh, you demonstrated that there could be evidence against it, and so as a consequence, like <laughs> it just seems like that's what you need in order to start competing as an explanation for our observations. And it's something that it has over other um, explanations that are unfalsifiable. Wait, th that we're in, I feel like we're kind of changing what we mean by unfalsifiable, right? When I say, say that something is unfalsifiable, I mean that it can't be ruled out. No observation rules it out, right? It could just decrease its probability or it could just be evidence against it, yeah? So when we look at theism and we say, okay, well, in order to have a mind, you have to have a body, that isn't ruling out theism, right? It's just kind of background belief that we have, which um, counts against theism, but theism might have other virtues, right? Maybe theism is simpler than the multiverse theory, making it overall better. Right, but I don't think that, I mean, if it predicts everything, how does it predict anything? Well, I already went over that. It explains the explanation. It explains everything, but it, how does that, if everything raises the probability of it, you're not raising the probability of the hypothesis at all. But I am, right? Because I'm appealing to explanatory virtues that don't have anything to do with my observation. No, that's not, uh, like you mentioned earlier, that's not raising the probability of the hypothesis being true. That's, use, that's, just, um, that's just adjudicating between hypotheses. Well, that's just, well, yeah, that's just how science works. We adjudicate. I don't see the, what's the problem there? Well, remember the question was, uh, how can you show that there could be evidence for or against a hypothesis, right? And uh, the idea is that if you can show that there's evidence against a hypothesis, it can be disconfirmed. And so that's how you can constrain a hypothesis and demonstrate that there could be um, evidence that raises the probability of it being true. But if uh, the hypothesis is consistent with all states of affairs, you can't do that. And if you can't do that, then how can you say that there's a set of evidence that your hypothesis explains in the first place? Well, the, the multiverse theory is just the perfect example, right? So we, we see that the universe is finely tuned, and we say, okay, what explains this? And the multiverse theory explains it, right? And then, but the thing is, is that there's no way to falsify the multiverse theory, because no matter what the universe was like, the multiverse theory would still be possible. So what we've got here is an explanation that's unfalsifiable, where no observation, no observational evidence could, could raise its probability. The... Um, the reason that we posit the multiverse is just conceptual, right? So why can't theism just work like the multiverse theory? That's what I want to know. I mean, the problem is, is that wouldn't it coarsely to the universe also supposedly be evidence for the multiverse theory? Well, I guess it depends what you mean by evidence, right? If you mean... I can yeah. I can tell you right now. Evidence is uh, any observation that, if true, raises the probability of your hypothesis being true. Yeah. So when we look at a, if we had a coarsely tuned universe and we were observing it, well, um, we might not think that there's something to be explained there. Right? We might just say, well, this wasn't that improbable. So we just don't have an explanation. So you're saying a coarsely tuned universe would be evidence against a multiverse? No, it just might be that there's no explanation there. I don't understand how you can say the multiverse is explanatory hypothesis then. Because it explains the explanation of the finely tuned universe, right? Yeah, but it apparently is unfalsifiable, so it explains any observations. Well, it's compatible with any observation, right? May not explain any observation because there may be certain observations that just aren't explanandums, right? Like there are observation, there are, there are observa observations which call for an explanation and there are observations which aren't. Maybe a coarsely tuned universe doesn't call for an explanation, but a finely tuned one does. If you saw a coarsely tuned universe, would that lower the probability of the multiverse hypothesis?
No, because on the multiverse theory, you expect you expect an infinite amount of universes, and some of those would be causally tuned. Yeah, I don't I don't see how that explains anything. But it does, right? Because we look at our universe, we see it's finely tuned, and we say, what explains this? And a thing that explains it is the multiverse. Now, you say, well, that can't be falsified. You're correct. It can't be falsified, but it still is an explanation. How does it explain it, though? Because we might think that a finely tuned universe is something to be explained, right? And we say, okay, what kind of hypothesis might be true? which would lead to there being a finely tuned universe. And one and you know, one such explanation is the multiverse. Another would be that God finely tuned the universe for intelligent life, right? That's you know, another explanation. So like another way of looking at this is um, what is generated by the hypothesis. It doesn't seem like uh, our observations of a finely tuned universe is generated both by a God hypothesis or the multiverse hypothesis. But, but it is generated, right? Because on the multiverse hypothesis, there's an infinite amount of universes making the probability of a finely tuned universe existing one. And on the God created the universe and he wanted it to be intelligent. Uh, he wanted it to be finely tuned for intelligent life. The probability of that being, of there being that universe is also one, right? So it just gives an explanation, but it can't be falsified. How can the probability, I mean, the probability of it being coarsely tuned universe is also one. Exactly. That's so it does, it's not going to raise. It's not going to raise the uh, likelihood of the hypothesis being true. Right, but it does because if our other explanation is that it's just um, chance that we got a finely tuned universe, it might be very improbable that there's a finely tuned universe on chance. But if there's a multiverse, then it's not improbable, right? If the probability is one, that means it's certainly true. You can't have certainly true contradictory hypotheses. Right. What do you mean by contradictory hypothesis? If if the multiverse rules out God and God rules out the multiverse. Well, no, they don't. No, you could have God and a multiverse. No, no. They don't rule each other out. The contradictory pieces of evidence would be a finely tuned universe versus a coarsely tuned universe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, true. Right, so the, the idea is that uh, if you see evidence for the other, um, that, and you're saying that raises the probability of the hypothesis being true, then seeing evidence for the other would actually lower the, um, the probability of the hypothesis being true. But you're, you're saying that seeing uh, either or states of affairs, finely tuned versus coarsely tuned, Raises the probability of a of the God hypothesis. Well, what I'm saying is just that the God hypothesis and the multiverse hypothesis give an explanation of what we observe without being falsifiable, right? That's all that I'm getting. Now, I don't know. I, I just don't see the problem with saying that. And you say, well, that isn't falsifiable, but um, yeah, who cares? I just don't see how it can explain it if it's not predicted by the hypothesis. But it is predicted. The probability on the multiverse hypothesis of that being a finely tuned universe is one. And the coarsely Same with the coarsely tuned universe. Exactly. It's compatible with any observation. That's why we, we don't use observation, right? We appeal to conceptual things like simplicity. Well, your worldview is just incoherent. If the probability is one, that means it's certainly true. And if finely and coarsely tuned universes are mutually exclusive, which presumably they are, then that just means that you have an incoherent world. No, they're not mutually ex exclusive, right? On the multiverse hypothesis, there's going to be an infinite number of um, coarsely tuned universes and an infinite number of finely tuned ones. Okay, I see what you're saying. So it, it explains the explanandum because it's a hypothesis that on that if were the hypothesis true, we would expect to see a finely tuned universe with a probability of one. But it isn't falsifiable because I can't check whether or not there is a multiverse. I'm locked into my universe, right? I don't understand what expect to see means if it's not observable. Well, we, we can observe it. We can observe our universe and say, oh, our universe is finely tuned. But I can't observe the multiverse. I can't get outside of my universe and have a look. 
Right, you, you can't. So you wouldn't expect, uh, you wouldn't expect a coarsely tuned universe because you can't, you can't. No, I would. Universe. The probability that there's a coarsely tuned universe um, is also one. But it's not something that you would expect to see, which is what you said, given the truth of the hypothesis. You can't observe. Yeah, I can't get outside of my finely tuned universe and observe if there is a multiverse. That's all that I said. So it's unfalsifiable. I just don't see how it does any explaining. <laughs> because on the hypothesis, the probability that there is the explanandum that we want explained is one. So it gives us an explanation. I don't understand what you think an explanation is. Well, an explanation is just a hypothesis. It's a posit which explains the explanandum. Yeah, but I don't understand how it does that if it doesn't generate predictions. See, look at this. Like, when this seems like it's a metaphysical type of view, right? And so there would have to be some sort of uh, consequence for there to be a difference between the multiverse or God or whatever. But I don't see how there could be uh, a difference that it makes to any possible observer. Well, the differences would be consensual, right? Maybe um, theism doesn't cohere with our background beliefs as well as the multiverse. Or maybe the multiverse hypothesis is simpler. But that doesn't have anything to do with what I can observe. That's just consensual, right? No, I agree. Uh, but what I'm trying to figure out is whether or not... Um, you think that it's what's being explained is empirical? Well, what's, what's being explained is my observation that we're in a finely tuned universe, but the explanation itself isn't an empirical. But I agree that the multiverse hypothesis is basically metaphysical. Um, Wait, do you think the finely tuned universe is evidence for the hypothesis? Uh, in your sense of the word evidence, um, yeah. Because the probability that we'd expect to see a finely tuned universe is one. Right, so you do think it's empirical? No, I think the hypothesis is metaphysical, but we can still have observations which um, we can explain with metaphysical hypothesis. Wait, but the probability that we observe it isn't one, right? Because um, there's no reason for us to observe a finely tuned one as opposed to a coarsely tuned one, given the multiverse hypothesis. So it doesn't actually raise the probability of the finely tuned one over the coarsely tuned one. But in the coarsely tuned universe, there isn't any life to observe the universe. Wait, that doesn't follow. Yes, it does. It's coarsely tuned. Yeah, it could be coarsely tuned for life. No, that's it, it, a finely tuned universe. Is just a universe that pro that produces um, life, right? If it's not, if it's coarsely tuned, there's no life in that. That's what I mean. By wait, wait, tuned. okay. So the fine tuning argument. Is the argument that our universe is life permitting? That doesn't make sense, right? Finely tuned means that the constants are like, you know, there's such a marginal difference in a constant, such a marginal difference in the way the constants would have been would cause there for life to not be permittable. It means for the universe to be finely tuned. It doesn't yeah. really mean that there is life. A tuned argument would just be a really bad argument. <laughs> I, I also, yeah, I think it is a bad argument, but I'm not making the fine-tuning argument, right? I'm just speaking about whether well, we can have explanations that aren't falsifiable, and clearly we can. Well, no, I'm saying that that isn't the fine-tuning argument, right? The fine-tuning argument isn't merely that our universe is life-permitting. It's that the constants, if there was marginal shift in the variables, that our uh, life-permitting, finely-tuned universe Right, it's not just saying. Yeah, it's not just saying that. That's, cool. that's yeah. Right. Yeah. So you can have a course that's life permitting. Uh, Vic, you're breaking up, by the way. Yeah, I didn't hear what you just said. You're gonna have to repeat yourself. Firstly, tuned universe that was life permitting is that you can make you know big changes in the constants. And the universe would still be life permitting, right? There wouldn't be like a Goldilocks zone or but, right. So you could still have a coarsely tuned universe that was life permitting. Now, I'm saying the multiverse doesn't actually 
the prediction that we observe of, because we could just observe a coarsely tuned universe given the multiverse hypothesis. So I don't think that there's that the fact that we're in a finely tuned one is actually evidence for there being a multiverse. Um, yeah, I really couldn't understand that. Bit. So you're going to have to like, maybe come off this cord and log back in or something. I feel like kind of the same thing is being repeated, though. The idea is that um, something is evidence for a hypothesis if it raises the probability of that hypothesis being true, if our observation of it raises the probability of that hypothesis being true. And you're saying that, well, what were you about to say, Vic? Yeah, no, I was going to make sure that we qualify that there has to be an observation that counts as evidence. Right. right. And the finding the uh, multiverse hypothesis doesn't predict that we observe a finely tuned universe, we observe a coarsely tuned universe that was life permitting. Right. That's that's I've kind of already I've kind of said that a few times. Right. Right. It doesn't seem like it's uh, predicted by the hypothesis. What you mean by finely tuned is that the universe is life permitting? Then you really need an explanation for the fact that. We live in a universe that's life permitting, right? We're we're alive in some place that, and obviously it doesn't need an explanation, right? That's just right. So the the thing that people want to say needs an explanation is the fact that if the constants were even slightly in any direction, then the universe would not be life permitting, right? And they're saying that is what needs an explanation. People are positing. You know that God designed a universe, or that there's a multiverse, or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not saying what we're disagreeing about that. Like, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, uh, no, no, no. Well, I mean, I just wanted to like slightly clarify what you were saying earlier because. Um, the multiverse hypothesis does predict that we observe a finely tuned, or rather, you said that on our view, it would be evidence, or in my view, or whoever's view, it would be evidence. But I just on anybody's view, right? So I was thinking that that might just be incoherent to construe, and that's what I was trying to explain. <laughs> um. Okay. Well, Joe, do you have anything else to uh, say? Yeah, so I, I think the idea here is that if it's unfalsifiable, then it doesn't really seem like you could say that it's uh, one of the explanations that competes for a set of evidence, right? So you wouldn't even use explanatory virtues to adjudicate between uh, that hypothesis versus another hypothesis. Yeah, I don't see how that follows. Well, it's there's no evidence for it, then how can you say that it explains the evidence? So oh, one thing to think about with evidence, with explanations, is that explanations have to sort of like rule out certain things that we would also presumably expect or something, right? So let's say like, I know that there is a ball in the forest, but then I go in the forest and I see like a red ball. Well, I wouldn't need an explanation for why there was a ball in the forest, right? Because I already know there's going to be a ball in the forest. But I want an explanation for, like, why it's red, right? Or why it's between two particular trees or something, <clears throat> right? So I'd want some kind of explanation that would rule out um, the, the facts that I thought could have occurred but didn't occur, right? So that's the sense in which explanations actually do need to rule out observations uh, otherwise they're not explaining it telling me you know, oh. yeah I, I don't agree that an explanation does need to rule out other observations right in the case of the ball in the forest maybe an explanation is that there was somebody in in the forest who had the ball who kicked it between those trees right but the person could have just as easily kicked it between some other trees but it's it's still an explanation for why the ball is there even though it's compatible with the ball being in different locations. 
Well, no, no, no. So you don't need an explanation for the fact that explains another, right? That, that's what you're getting at. Because if you're, if you're wondering what the explanation is there versus somewhere else, then you just want an ex, uh, like a meta explanation, an explanation for the explanation. But we're just talking about the explanation for the facts, right? And I'm saying the explanation for the fact actually has to rule out contradicting facts that you would have expected, right? It doesn't have to, you know, rule out that, um, or it's not going to be a good explanation if it tells you everything that you already would have expected, right? Yeah, I don't agree. I think that if we if we come to find a ball in the forest, we can say, why is the ball in this place rather than another place? And one explanation would be that somebody dropped the ball there, right? Yeah. And then you could say, well, they could have dropped the ball anywhere else, so nothing is explained by that explanation. No. Because it doesn't rule out the other locations of the ball. No, no, that's asking for an explanation for the explanation. About. No, it's just asking for an explanation of the observation that a ball is in that particular place. Right, but the fact that someone dropped the ball in the... That... That doesn't in that place right now you can ask why would he drop it there as opposed to somewhere else but that's asking for why the explanandum occurred right that, that you already explained the explanan now you want an explanation for the explanandum no, okay. what you said is that what you said is that an explanation needs to rule out other observations i disagree and what i'm what i'm pointing out here is that the explanation that, that a person dropped a ball in that place in the forest doesn't rule out them dropping the ball in any other location. Well, yeah, it does, right? Because that fact is clearly inconsistent. They can't drop the ball there and not drop the ball there, right? But they could have dropped it in any other place, right? Right, but they then the explanation... Right, but look, look, then the explanation would just be false. We're talking about given the truth of the explanation, right? Given the truth of the explanandum, then the explanand follows. Right. So other logically, other um, possible observations would have been inconsistent with him dropping the ball in between those two particular trees. Right. Obviously, he could have dropped the ball somewhere different, but that's just changing the explanation. Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. I'll be I'll, um, I made a mistake there. That's fine. So that wasn't a good example. I think that the best example of this um, just is the multiverse. I don't understand what's wrong with the multiverse hypothesis. Can you can you just tell me what's wrong with it though? Well, um, I kind of talked about it earlier, right? If given the multiverse hypothesis, we wouldn't or we wouldn't expect that we observe a finely tuned universe, then it mean that the universe is finely tuned because it's equally likely that we live in a coarsely tuned universe given the multiverse hypothesis. Well, well, the idea is that were the universe coarsely tuned, there wouldn't be any life. But then that would just make it that we want like an explanation for like, some kind of like tautology, live somewhere that's permittable to life. But we it's don't not want a tautology. tautology it's, it's not a tautology. It's just to say what explains well, if that we think... observe that the universe is finely tuned. No, but I'm saying if you think that it's just incoherent to live in a coarsely tuned universe, right? I'm not construing it that way. I'm taking it that a coarsely tuned universe is just the universe that is life permitting, right? Because that's just what tuned means, is tuned for life, right? It's coarsely tuned for life. That just means that the constants could have shifted to a large degree and it would still be permitted for life, right? It would still permit life. That's the idea... The, the idea for the fine-tuning argument is that if the constants were in a different, even slightly uh, changed, there wouldn't be any life, right? So there's a Goldilocks right. zone for life. That's the idea. So a coarsely tuned universe, in the way that I'm using these terms, doesn't have any life in it. No, no, that's not. Vic is right about what it means for something to be a coarsely tuned universe. It's coarsely tuned uh, isn't a universe that has it tweaked so no life occurs. It's a universe where the laws can be much more relaxed and still permit life. Okay, so if, if the terms are actually used that way, then that's my mistake. But I'm just using the term coarsely tuned to mean a non-life permitting universe. Right, so then that's the thing that I was saying about like 
the ball in the forest, right? If you already know there's going to be then the explanation isn't you that there's a ball in the forest, right? You already know that fact, right? That's not something you're going to need explained. You're going to need something surprising, right? Like, why is the ball red, for example? Right? Or why is the ball between these or something? That, yeah, right? <clears throat> so just the fact that the universe really is inhabitable, life permitting, obviously that doesn't need an explanation because we already knew that the universe was going to be life permitting because there's life in it, right? So that wouldn't actually be... Something no, that's that Vic, 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 that's like if you survived a car crash and I said, how did you survive that car crash? And you say, well, if I hadn't survived, I wouldn't be here speaking to you. There's nothing to well, be explained. Well, no, no, but it's surprising to survive a car crash, right? Because, you know, we take it that it's like unlikely to survive a car crash or something. But the fine-tuning argument is that it's unlikely that we be in a universe, that there be a universe fun, that is finely tuned. I don't, that's, I don't take, well, okay, but again, when you say finely tuned, that has to do with like the Goldilocks zone, right? It's not merely that the universe is life permitting, because if the universe was coarsely tuned, it could still be life permitting, and it wouldn't be surprising, presumably, right? If we lived in the universe, there wouldn't be a fine tuned argument. Right, There's finely like, tuned. Finely tuned talks about a universe where there still is nonetheless life. It's just uh, that life is in a gold, Goldilocks state, like you described. It's not that life is unlikely to occur in a finely tuned universe. It's that that fine that universe is finely tuned for life to occur. Yeah, I don't see how that changes anything. Well. Again- the final Nick, you've really got to fix your audio now. Yeah. So the idea okay. is that um, it's already expected, right? I mean, it's not, that's not the thing that's, uh, that you're trying to explain. You already know that life um, arises because the universe was finely tuned for life. Now, what I, want to ex- what I want explained is why there is a finely tuned universe over a non-finely tuned universe. And, right. um, and I'm saying that the, the most doesn't predict that because we're not under your con- the fine tune just yeah Vic we can't on un- Vic we, we can't understand like I think I'm just gonna have to stick with Joe because it's really hard for me to try and respond to what you're saying okay that's fine yeah it's just uh, so we've kind of already haggled through all, all the already repeated again it just doesn't seem like uh it doesn't seem like you have evidence that would raise the likelihood of the hypothesis being true, the multiverse hypothesis being true, if you saw a finely tuned universe, because uh, it's not going to make it um, more likely that we would expect to see this evidence if we would have the same ex- expectation for a coarsely tuned universe. But in, a, in the way that I'm using the word coarsely tuned universe, there isn't any life, right? So we couldn't observe it. So yeah, it's just, this is just to say that, look, there's a finely tuned universe. You might think that that's improbable. And then we say, OK, what explains that? And the explanations that are on the table, there's the multiverse hypothesis, which a lot of theists believe in, sorry, which a lot of um, physicists believe in, is not falsifiable because there's no way to observe the multiverse and check if it's there. We're locked into our own universe. Yeah, but the thing is, you're still identifying something that if we observed it, it would um, be evidence against the hypothesis. Well, there couldn't be evidence against the multiverse hypothesis, not in a direct observational way anyway. Maybe you could find like an internal contradiction in the multiverse hypothesis or something. Well, that wouldn't be evidence against it. That would just be what you described, the uh, internal contradiction. But the thing is, isn't the, isn't, Evidence against a multiverse hypothesis, a non-multiverse. But how can I observe the non-multiverse? So the thing is, if if it were the case that uh, that there is no multiverse, right? It's just a uh, one single universe. Would that be uh, something that you don't expect on the multiverse hypothesis? Well, given the truth of the multiverse hypothesis, we would expect finely tuned universes and coarsely tuned universes, right? 
you would expect multiple universes. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you only see one universe, right, then that would uh, that would actually uh, be evidence against the multiverse. Well, I can't observe uh, only one universe, right? I can't check if there are other universes because I'm in my own one. Right, but if that was an observation. But it isn't, then it can't be. Uh, am I still cutting you out now, or am I better? I turn my you're a bit better. But Wait, I feel like I'm getting somewhere with Joe. So let's just stick. With, I just want to stick I, with Joe. I just don't. I don't understand how uh, it wouldn't be evidence going against the multiverse hypothesis. Because, because if that can't it's be done. That... Because it's not possible to observe the non-multiverse. That's the point. It's unfalsifiable. We can't observe it. It's just like somebody could say, well, theism is falsifiable because you could observe and not a god, right? And then, you know, that, that's silly. Obviously, you can't observe and not a god. That's why theism is unfalsifiable. Um, so the thing is, is that it, it's not raising the, like, no observation is going to raise the likelihood of it being true then. No observation. But observation isn't what we use. Uh, how do you, what's evidence for a hypothesis then? It will be at the like ab explanatory virtue, simplicity, explanatory scope, and so forth. That's not evidence for a hypothesis. Well, in a sense it's evidence, I mean, in another sense it's not. If by evidence you just mean observational evidence, then it's not observational evidence. I mean, no, that's, that's just not evidence, the, like, Evidence for a hypothesis is it pointing out that it only has three auxiliary hypotheses versus seven auxiliary hypotheses? You're just you're just stating the how many hypotheses are make up a single um, explanation that you're but putting that, up. That is evidence, right? That's an that's abductive evidence. That's an explanatory virtue, and that's what physicists will use to adjudicate between the multiverse theories. I don't see how that's evidence. What do you mean? If you mean observational evidence, it's not observational evidence. If you mean broadly speaking evidence, then it's broadly speaking evidence. That's what physicists will actually use. What do you mean by evidence? Yeah, I just mean broadly speaking something that counts in favor of, an, of a theory. Um, so do you think the fact that it has more auxiliary hypotheses lowers the probability that it's true in so Okay, I think yeah. I'm just going yeah. to, to butt in. He, like, these guys do want to do somewhat of a proper debate, so if they're asking for you to butt out for now, Vic, then you should, but if they want to do, like, a talk after or something, that's fine. Yeah, I can't do two people at once. It's too hard. I mean, did you hear Vic's uh, question, though? How you does that raise the probability? Yeah, like, uh... The number of auxiliary hypotheses a, um, an explanation has, do you think that it raises the likelihood of a hypothesis? Well, it's, it's a conceptual virtue. If it doesn't raise a probability of a hypothesis being true, how could it be evidence for it? Well, it does raise the probability. It's just not an observation. It's purely conceptual. How does it raise the probability of it being true? Well, because for any given claim, there's a probability that that claim is false. Ergo, the more claims that you make, the higher the probability that at least one of those claims will be false. And that's just a priori. I don't, I don't really think I need to explain Occam's razor, guys. Well, the, the idea is that you can just point to other explanatory virtues, right? that um, make it so they're all necessary entities, or necessary auxiliary hypotheses, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you obviously there's a, bulk, there's a group of explanatory virtues and you need to assess overall which theory is the most virtuous. I agree with that. Well, like if you appeal to ontological economy, right, um, you explain why there are all these auxiliary hypotheses Right, you explain why they are uh, like necessary, and it's due to other explanatory virtues. So that seems to undermine the probability calculus that you just gave. 
No, it doesn't, right? Because all things held equal, simplicity is to be preferred. But if it's not equal, because um, maybe this particular theory has other explanatory virtues which make it better than the other hypothesis, then um, that would undermine that particular, you know, you would have an outweighing of explanatory virtues. Even though it was deficient in one sense because it was less simple, it was uh, had, you know, an advantage in other senses. Yeah, I'm just not, I mean, now it just seems like you're bracketing it out. Which explanatory virtues do you appeal to uh, to demonstrate that you have evidence for or against your hypothesis? Yeah, simplicity, coherence with background beliefs, degree of ad hocness, explanatory power, explanatory scope. What do you mean by ad hocness? Degree of contrivance. Right, it seems like... Um, ad hocness that's going to deal with uh, trying to explain our observations again. Well, it's explaining our observations, right? That's what we just mean by the explanation. But it's not as though we can observe, because we're stipulating that this hypothesis is unfalsifiable, it's not as though we can observe to check if the hypothesis is true, right? Wait, well, I don't understand that. Well, given the multi... Assume the multiverse hypothesis is true. There's no way we can observe not a multiverse or observe a multiverse because we're locked into our universe, right? So it's unfalsifiable. But there might still be uh, benefits of positing the multiverse. Uh, did you hear me? Sorry. No, I didn't. I uh, was just asking, what are you positing it to explain? In the case of the multiverse, it might explain the uh, fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. That's the explanation. How is it, um, how is it uh, generated by the multiverse hypothesis? Because given the multiverse hypothesis, there's a probability of one that there will be a finely-tuned universe. So it has really high explanatory power, right? Because given the multiverse hypothesis, there's certainty that there'll be a finely tuned universe. Well, I mean, if it just follows necessarily, that doesn't, doesn't seem follow like it's the next one. Yes, it, it is. It's a probability of one is just uh, the equivalent to saying it follows necessarily. Oh, okay. yeah. If, if that's what you mean, then sure, it would follow necessarily. So it's very high in explanatory power. But maybe there's other ex um, explanatory virtues that it's deficient in which would lead us not to posit the multiverse. Maybe there's another explanation, which is better. That just seems like it's a tautology, then. It just no, deductively it's follows. It's not deductive, it's abductive. We're saying what explains the observation? Oh, the multiverse would explain it. Yeah, but if you're saying that it has a probability of one, then it, you're saying that it necessarily follows. No, I'm not. It doesn't. It? it could be that there was a finely tuned universe and no multiverse, right? It's just that if there was a multiverse, it would follow uh, necessarily that there was a finely tuned one, a finely tuned universe. So it sounds like now you're identifying uh, if if it were true, it would actually be evidence against the multiverse. No, it wouldn't be. It would be evidence, um, well, it wouldn't really be evidence for or evidence against, it would just be explained. On the multiverse, we would expect to see a finely tuned universe. Wait a minute, what were you just describing earlier? Because it sounded like you were describing things that made it so it wasn't just something that deductively follows. Yeah, it doesn't deductively follow because it doesn't follow that from the finely tuned universe, there is a multiverse. But it does follow that from the multiverse, there is a finely tuned universe, making it an explanation. I mean, I don't see how that follows. <laughs> well, just, think, just think through it, right? We see the finely tuned universe. What explains this? What, if true, would entail or would raise the probability of there being this observation? In the case of a finely tuned universe, the multiverse would.
Yeah, but uh, not seeing a multiverse, you said, would also raise the probability. But we can't observe not a multiverse. Yeah, but if we were... That doesn't make <laughs> any sense. sense. Look, how can you say that... Uh, that's, like that saying I, that's like saying I can observe and not a god. What does that even mean? God isn't the kind of thing that can be observed. Neither is the multiverse. In order to observe the multiverse, you'd have to stand outside of the multiverse and observe it, but that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I don't see how you could say... Uh, it sounds it sounded to me like you, you said we would observe a finely tuned universe, right? But if we observed, say, a coarsely tuned universe, would that be evidence for or against the multiverse? Um, well, no, it wouldn't be evidence for or against it, right? Because given the truth of the multiverse, we would expect to see a cool... We wouldn't expect to see it because we wouldn't be in a coarsely tuned universe with how I'm using it. But there would be, with how I'm using the term, but there would be a coarsely tuned universe, sure. Well, wait a minute. Uh, is it evidence for or against the multiverse? I didn't understand. Is, is what evidence? Observing the coarsely tuned universe? Or yeah. just there being a course leak, well, we couldn't observe it, right? No, if it's a if it's a case, if the state of affairs were different, such that we were in a coarsely tuned universe, would that be evidence for or against a multiverse? Yeah, it wouldn't be evidence for or against it. Yeah. It's compatible with the multiverse. So And it's also compatible well, wait with a minute. Not the why, multiverse. Why is well wait a minute, why is finally tuned? Tuning not evidence for or against it all of a sudden. Well, because we might think that it's improbable that there'd be a finely tuned universe, making the multiverse hypothesis a um, something we might want to posit that could be better than just saying, oh, it's just chance that we got a finely tuned universe. That's just comparing different hypotheses, a hypothesis on chance versus, say, the multiverse hypothesis. That's but the what issue is, the, what, the thing is, is that... Um, I'm not, I don't understand why seeing a finely tuned universe raises the probability of the uh, multiverse hypothesis as being true to one, whereas a coarsely tuned universe... No, wait, that's not what I said. I didn't say that observing, the observing a finely tuned universe raises the uh, probability of the multiverse to one. You could observe a finely tuned universe and then not be a multiverse. It might just be luck that we've got a finely tuned universe. So I thought you were pointing to the fact that the universe was finely tuned as evidence for the multiverse. And that's what we're explaining. Right. So uh, is it so does it raise the probability of the multiverse hypothesis being true? Well, given the truth of the multiverse hypothesis, we'd expect to see a finely tuned universe. So that's, that will be a yes. Right. But um, it's also the case that uh, given, uh, well. Now, in the case of a coarsely tuned universe, we might not think that a coarsely tuned universe is improbable. So that just wouldn't be something to be explained. I'm sorry? In the case of a coarsely tuned universe, we might not think that a coarsely tuned universe is improbable, right? So then we just say that there wasn't something to be explained. There would be no need to posit a multiverse if we were in a coarsely tuned universe. Why not? Because we might not think that a coarsely tuned universe is improbable. So wait, uh, I don't understand this at all. You're saying that now you are saying that a coarsely tuned universe, if we found ourselves in a coarsely tuned universe, that would be evidence against the multiverse? No, it wouldn't be evidence for or against it. We might not even need to, we probably wouldn't even need to posit a multiverse because we might not think that that's improbable. I mean, why can't the same just be said about a finely tuned universe? Because the idea is that the finely tuned universe is improbable, calling for an explanation. Well, uh, well, wait a minute. Why is it considered improbable on the multiverse? It's not considered improbable on the multiverse. The observation itself 
is improbable. We might think that there's way uh, there's other um, ways that the fine that the tuning of the constants could have gone, making it improbable that they be so finely tuned. Yeah, but the issue is we're asking what does the multiverse hypothesis explain? And so the idea is that the multiverse hypothesis. Uh, you're saying would generate the expectation that we're in a finely tuned universe. And so uh, that would be evidence for it. But now you're saying that it, it wouldn't be evidence for the multiverse hypothesis? No, I'm saying it would be. That's why we're positing it. So there, the issue is, is that uh, seeing a finely tuned universe wouldn't be improbable. It would be improbable were there no multiverse which is why we posit the multiverse. Yeah, so the thing is, is that, uh, is it the case, that you, if you're expecting a multi, I'm sorry, you're expecting a finely tuned universe or coarsely tuned universe, one of them um, just wouldn't be an expectation of the hypothesis. But uh, now it just seems well, like- no, you, On the multiverse be... hypothesis, you would expect both of them, right? Because there's an infinite number of universes. Well, then how does uh, any particular observation, whether or not we're in a finely tuned or coarsely tuned universe, raise the probability of the hypothesis being true? Because, we, because compared to the alternatives, the multiverse might be a better explanation. Um, I, don't, I don't think I answered the question. How does it raise the probability, those, given the observation that we're in a finely tuned universe, or given the observation that we're in a coarsely tuned universe, how does that raise the probability of the multiverse hypothesis being? Because given the truth of the multiverse hypothesis, we would expect to see that. Yeah, but neither of them make, make the multiverse uh, hypothesis any likelier, right? It doesn't raise the probability of it being true if... Um, all states of affairs are consistent with the hypothesis. But it does, right? It's not observational. It's just a conceptual virtue. It's explanatory power. Yeah, but we're talking about observations. Observing a universe that's finely tuned versus uh, it being the case that you observe the universe is coarsely tuned. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Right, so uh, the issue is, is that... Uh, if you want to say that these observations raise the probability of the hypothesis being true, uh, like it doesn't seem like you can adjudicate. Oh, wait, hold on. Let me think about how to explain this to you first. Okay, so the idea is that neither state of affairs makes the hypothesis. Um, like it any more likely it doesn't raise the probability of the hypothesis being true so he um doesn't seem like it would be evidence for the hypothesis but the hypothesis is being true raises the probability that we would see the um, observation that's explanatory power yeah but if um, the hypothesis expects these observations you're just saying if the hypothesis were true then the hypothesis is true you're not saying anything no, what I'm saying is that if the hypothesis is true, we have these observations that we want explained. So that's just an explanation that we've got. Now, the fact that um, I could observe a finely tuned universe and the multiverse still be true, or I could observe a coarsely tuned universe and the, multi and the multiverse still be true, changes nothing. Right, you're, all that you're doing is saying that it's unfair. Is all that you're doing is saying that it's unfalsifiable. I've already said that it's unfalsifiable. We both agree that the multiverse theory can't be falsified by observation because there's no way I can observe not a multiverse. Well, then I didn't even see how you, like, what observation do you think that it would compete for um, as the best explanation? What observation do I think that it would compete for? So, uh, can you rephrase that? Uh, so the idea of uh, why you use explanatory virtues is to pick the best um, explanation that competes for er, um, explaining a set of facts, a set of observations. But 
uh, if it's unfalsifiable, then there are no set of observations that you would expect to see on the hypothesis. So it wouldn't be in the competition at all. But it is in the composition and it is unfalsifiable. And the way that I adjudicate is by using other explanatory virtues that aren't observation. Um, how? Simplicity, explanatory scope, explanatory power, degree of ad hocness. And the others, uh, there's lots of explanatory virtues. So the idea is that with simplicity, it uses the fewest number of auxiliary hypotheses, the uh, fewest necessary auxiliary hypotheses to explain the evidence. Mm -hmm. But if it's unfalsifiable, it, um, you're saying that it doesn't explain the evidence. There's no evidence that it does explain. No, it, it does so explain the say, evidence. It's how just can not you falsifiable. Say, How does it explain the evidence if uh, no, the if hold on if no observation Sorry. raises the likelihood of the hypothesis being true? Because given the truth of the hypothesis, we would expect the observation that we have, giving it explanatory power. You would expect any observation, right? Right. So it's not raising the so any observation. Isn't just make, isn't making the hypothesis more likely? Um, isn't raising? I'm sorry. Isn't raising the probability of the hypothesis being not by direct observation? No, but I'm not talking about using direct observation. I'm talking about using conceptual virtues. Right. One of those is simplicity. But remember how simplicity has made sense. It's the fewest number of necessary auxiliary hypotheses. But the issue is, it's the fewest number of necessary auxiliary hypotheses uh, that are posited to explain the evidence. But if you're saying that uh, if you're saying that the multiverse hypothesis doesn't explain the evidence, it's unfalsifiable, then you can't even say that uh, it has the fewest number of auxiliary hypotheses that um, because it's all predicated upon whether or not it has the fewest number of auxiliary hypotheses needed to explain the evidence. Yeah, it doesn't follow that because a theory explains something, it has to be falsifiable. The multiverse theory explains the observation, but it can't be falsified. But uh, you wouldn't be able to, like I just showed, you wouldn't be able to show that um, you can uh, apply the explanatory virtue of simplicity Oh, I can apply it. No, because remember, it's the fewest number of auxiliary hypotheses needed to explain our observation. Mm -hmm. And then I can say, well, this multiverse theory with this mathematical model has more assumptions in it, or more auxiliary, uh, auxiliary hypothesis, sorry, than this other one. So this one is higher in, in that particular explanatory version. But it's not explained, but you just said because that it's unfalsifiable. So there's nothing that it, it explains in the first place. That doesn't follow that because it's unfalsifiable, it doesn't explain anything. It does explain something, but it can't be falsified. So there can be evidence that makes the likelihood of the multiverse hypothesis being true. Uh, it raises its likelihood of it being true, I mean. Yeah, that's just a confusing way to put it. The, the right way to put it is just to say that we have an observation that calls for an explanation, and then we say the multi, we um, take like the multiverse hypothesis. And the multiverse hypothesis, if it were true, would produce this observation. Um, but if, it's, if it were true, it also proved produce any other state of affairs like you said mm -hmm. yeah so how does our um, observing this state of affairs raise the probability of because, it being... because if it wasn't true we might think that it's very improbable that we have this particular observation no but the idea is you're already assuming that's true we're not assuming that it's true at all. We're just saying, what's the observation? 
is it improbable that we have this observation? Were the multiverse not true? We might think that it is. Is it probable that we have this observation um, if the multiverse is true? We might think that it is, making the multiverse hypothesis a good explanation for we for our observation. Sorry for our observation. How can it be a good um, explanation for our observation if it if the observation would make it improbable that the multiverse is true. The observation wouldn't make it improbable. Yeah, but you said that it could be the case that our observation would make it improbable. No, it wouldn't. That's not what I said. Could you repeat the improbable part then? Yeah, what I said is that we might think it's improbable that given the falsity of the multiverse hypothesis, we have this particular explanation. We might think that it's probable, given the truth of the multiverse hypothesis, that we do have the observation, making the multiverse hypothesis a good explanation. That's just what explanatory power means. Wait, could you repeat that again? Yeah, we might think that it's improbable that given the falsity of the multiverse hypothesis, we have the particular observation that we do have. But we might think that given the truth of the multiverse hypothesis, that it is probable that we have the explanation that we do have, making the multiverse hypothesis a good explanation. Right, that's how our observation is counting as evidence for the multiverse, because given the... I, I'm, I'm not going to repeat anything. Given what, sorry? Given the truth of the multiverse hypothesis, we would expect to see the observation that we do have, but given the falsity, of the multiverse hypothesis, we would think that it's improbable that we have the, the observation that we do. Why is that? Well, maybe in our scientific theories, we would think that were there not a multiverse, it would be improbable that we have a finely tuned universe. That just seems like you're, that just seems like you would be evaluating another hypothesis. When we're talking about how would we evaluate the multiverse hypothesis, you're assuming that it's true, not uh, evaluating it as if it were false. I'm comparing um, the probability of our having the observation that we do have, if it's true, versus if it's false. So maybe the observation that I have, um, given the truth of the hypothesis, is one, right? But the, obs the probability that I have the observation that I do have, given the falsity of the hypothesis, is point 0.1. And in that case, my observation would be evidence for the hypothesis. But it could still be completely unfalsifiable. But to say that it's unfalsifiable means that all observations would, uh, would be evidence for the hypothesis. No, it's not. It's just to say that all observations are compatible with it. What's the difference? Well, you might not think that particular observations actually um, are improbable, right, given the falsity of the hypothesis. So those observations just wouldn't be evidence either way. But those observations would still be compatible with the multiverse. How do you adjudicate between uh, observations that would be evident? You just think that they're all compatible, that's it. That's what you think. Well, yeah, given the truth of the multiverse hypothesis, any observation is going to be compatible. Then it doesn't seem like it would explain them. It does, because given the falsity of the multiverse hypothesis, certain observations might be improbable. Why is that? So, because maybe, given our um, theories in physics, we think that the probability that there is a finely tuned universe is very low. I don't see how that's not something that would be compatible on your hypothesis. It is compatible. In this... right, I've so... already told you it's unfalsifiable. Right, so, like, look, it doesn't seem like this is, any of this is evidence for it. But it is evidence, right? Because I look at my observation and I say, what's the probability of this observation, given the falsity of the hypothesis? Maybe it's very improbable. 
what's the probability of this observation given the truth of the hypothesis? Maybe it's very probable. In that case, my observation counts as evidence for the hypothesis. Yeah, I just don't see it. I don't see how the, the fact that every single expectation is consistent with the hypothesis, that would make it so the hypothesis, uh, ha that would make it so you raise the probability of the hypothesis being true. Because given the falsity of the hypothesis, certain observations might be improbable. I don't know how to explain it any better. Does anyone else understand? I mean, maybe maybe we should just break it up to the chat because I'm not understanding this. Um, I'd want uh, to debate uh, in Super Bowl, but uh, if you don't mind. Like yeah, if that's you're fine. Done so uh, you're arguing that, uh, that uh, the probability of... Um, uh, finely tuned universe is uh, unlikely, but uh, I think that it uh, that by virtue but that all universes uh, are finely tuned by virtue of being universes, as life is just interaction between physical qualities, and uh, all universes contain interaction uh, between physical qualities. Yeah, that isn't what uh, I mean by life. I so mean, what do you mean by life? I mean conscious beings. Yeah, consciousness is just interaction between, uh, it's just a result of interaction between external uh, input uh, and uh, the structure of our brain. Yeah, I disagree. That's not how I'm using these terms. But you're getting into these um, like specifics of the multiverse. Say, 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 say like oxygen, oxygen couldn't uh, bond with uh, carbon, like uh, in... Uh, that's what you mean by like uh, uh, not finely tuned for life, right? Yeah, or if there wasn't even any matter, and you couldn't have conscious beings. Well, that that isn't to say, but that doesn't prove that there couldn't be another line of interaction between some properties that would lead to some conscious. Well, wait, you're getting into the specific. If you, could, if you, but if you can't so define well. life, if you can't define life, you can't say if you can't quantitatively define life, you can't say what is a probability or isn't a probability of it uh, appearing in any given unit. Yeah, you're going into the specifics of the fine tuning argument, but we're not talking about that. No, I'm saying I'm saying that an essential part of your argument is that uh, life occurring in. Uh, in certain universes is uh, unlikely, but uh, you haven't proved it because you can't quantitatively define life. So you, we can't, if we, if you, if you don't know to say, if you can't tell us what life is, then you can't say it's improbable that in a certain universe it won't occur. I think that in all universes, life is uh, life uh, already exists because there's no inherent differences between the interactions that constitute us and the interaction that constitute uh, anything else, like a rock or something. Yeah, you're not understanding the dialectic. We weren't talking about the fine-tuning argument specifically. We're just using the fine-tuning argument as a as a um, example to make a general point. I'm not interested in debating the specifics of the fine-tuning argument. So, so, okay, so just this example is just uh, wrong. Okay, that's fine. It doesn't matter. It's just a it's just a hypothetical example. Whether it's actually a hypothetical good example of what? Well, you're not understanding the dialectic, right? I don't want to just repeat what we're talking about. Okay, my bad. Okay, is there anybody else who's, who who um, like wants to address the specific topic? Um, Vic, I know you were trying to get in earlier. Did you have anything that you want to say? Uh, now it's you that is cutting out, Isaac. Sorry, 
I said, Vic, I know that you were trying to talk earlier. Do you have anything that you want to say? Now would be like a good time. Okay, all right. And um, here, Insup, I'll ask you one actually. Um, so I take you to be saying if observation X is more likely given that hypothesis Y is true than false, then observation X is evidence for hypothesis Y's truth over falsity. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, Joe was asking if that's what I interpret him as saying. So I think that is what he's saying. Does that does that like clarify to a point that you find it easier to interact with, or should we just stop here? <clears throat> okay, I think I think we're pretty much um done for now but I'd, I'll just say that this was all about falsifiability right that's the key point now the thing is is that it could be true that um, observation X raises the probability of hypothesis Y even though hypothesis Y is fully compatible with all observations given its truth yeah it might be completely unfalsifiable and that's just to say that falsifiability cannot be used as a kind of razor to just rule out possible explanations we use explanations that are unfalsifiable all the time one of them is the multiverse hypothesis that a lot of physicists believe well yeah it sounds like you're saying something like it could be that all observations could be the same whether the theory or the hypothesis is true or false but that it's likelier on the truth of the hypothesis than its falsity so it would count as evidence for its truth over falsity it's more likely that we observe those things given that it's true yeah that sounds like basically uh a good reduction yeah that's fine. like like I, it could be like i'm i don't want to make any specific statements about physics because i don't know anything about physics but it could be like our observations would be the same given that the multiverse is true or false um but those observations are likelier to occur given the truth so then that would be counting as evidence for the truth of it so i, I think i understand roughly what you're saying i think i agree overall fish i know that you wanted to also talk about the interpretation argument. Did you have anything you wanted to run on that before we kind of close things down? Um, well, I wanted to know like what his objections were to it, but did you see my response? Like the thing is, is that if every single observation is consistent with the hypothesis, then you can't say, you can't talk about likelihood at all. Well, that's not true, right? The observation might be compatible, but it might be less or more likely. How would you say that it's less or more likely? Given our, uh, given our well-established theories. I don't, I mean, the thing is, is that if it's compatible with it, it's going to raise the probability of the hypothesis, right? No, it might not be. It might be compatible, but it might not be more or less probable given our observation. So it might just not come as evident. Would uh, uh, if we don't see one of the these states of affairs, right? <laughs> Wait, if we don't. The thing is, is that it, like if everything is compatible with it, it it just doesn't move the hypothesis like uh, forward at all. But right. So the hypothesis, how so? You just said, well, how would you identify um, something that is merely compatible, and then say that that something actually raises the probability of the uh, multiverse hypothesis being true? Because given our theories, we might think it probable or improbable that we have this particular observation. Well, that just seems like you're saying uh, these observations would uh, confirm or disconfirm other theories, not the multiverse hypothesis. Well, the multiverse hypothesis is one of those theories. Yeah, so, like, the thing is, is that it's compatible with um, every single observation. Yeah. So it doesn't, so you're, I was asking you how it would raise the probability, but you just said how it might raise the probability of other hypotheses. Because given the falsity of the multiverse hypothesis, we might think it improbable that we have the particular observation that we do have. But given the truth of the hypothesis, we might think it probable that we have the observation that we do have. 
making our observation evidence for the hypothesis. Yeah, but if you think it's inf uh, unfalsifiable, you can't just say that. Uh, I mean, you're saying that you wouldn't be able to identify any state of affairs that would uh, that would obtain if the multiverse hypothesis was false. Hey, f that's not what unfalsifiability means. It's, uh, you, I mean, I'm saying that it would be uh, evidence for or against a hypothesis. You're saying that you can't identify any evidence at all that would be um, that would be evidence against the hypothesis. Okay. So you're saying that. So you're already saying that it would there wouldn't be anything that falsifies it. Sometimes I think that it's just helpful to get things written out. Like I'm not taking a side here, but I think I understand what INSEP is trying to say. So just like for the sake of clarity, just look at general. So say we have hypothesis A and hypothesis B, and both of them predict X, but X is predicted with a higher likelihood on A. So X is more likely on A than on B. So X counts more strongly as evidence for A than it would for B. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's basically what I'm trying to say. But it could be that A and B are both completely falsifi unfalsifiable. And that doesn't change anything. What are you talking about? Could be that there's no possible observation that we could ever use to disconfirm A or B. Right. Uh, because they might be fully compatible with any observation. To, to be clear, X could, if you, X could be the total set of observations. The thing is, is that if it predicts X and it will raise the likelihood of the hypothesis being true 80%, and if we go out there and we don't see X, it's not raising the likelihood of the hypothesis. Well, that would just be to say that we don't have the specific evidence that we're, talk we're trying to adjudicate on. Right. So, I mean... Well, then we wouldn't have even gotten into this whole discussion about what explains our observation, because we haven't got the observation. So there are no... Op I mean, the whole thing is the explanations are offered in order to explain our observation. Mm-hmm. Right, so if there's no observation, then what are you saying the multiverse explains? The multiverse does explain an observation that we do have. If we didn't have that observation, there wouldn't be any reason to posit the multiverse. But since we do have it, there's a reason to posit the explanation. Um, the issue is, is that if you're saying that it's compatible with every observation, you're saying that we're not going to ever have, not have an observation that would, uh, we would need to, that we wouldn't need to posit the multiverse hypothesis. No, that's right. not true. No, the, the certain, um, it might be that it's fully compatible with all observations, but certain observations just might not call for an explanation because they might not be improbable given the falsity of the hypothesis. So if we haven't observed any explanations that are improbable given the falsity of the hypothesis, there's just no reason to posit the explanation. We don't have anything to explain. Any explanations that are improbable? Or did so, you say observation? Observation. Right, so the thing is, is that um, every single observation is um, obtains given the multiverse hypothesis. Yeah, it's unfalsifiable. We've already said that. Right, so the idea of positing, well, if it was false, then uh, we wouldn't need to offer, offer it up as an explanation. But by saying that it's unfalsifiable, you're saying that that would never... No, that's not what I said. What I said is that given the truth of the hypothesis, um, it's compatible with any observation. Right, but certain observations might not call for the explanation because they might not be improbable given the falsity of the hypothesis. How do you figure out which um, which observations call for the explanation? By looking at our theories. Um, I don't uh, like. Why is it the case that uh, finally to universe is an observation that requires? an explanation like the multiverse hypothesis, but a coarsely tuned universe doesn't require an explanation that, um, like the multiverse hypothesis. 
because we might think that a finely tuned universe is improbable given the falsity of the hypothesis, but that a coarsely tuned universe is not improbable given the falsity of the hypothesis. But well, why would we think that? That's what I'm asking. We're looking at our theories. I don't understand that. Well I'm asking theory. you to explain. I'm, I'm asking you to talk about one theory right now, the multiverse hypothesis. By looking at our background theories, I mean, we might decide that it's not improbable that given the falsity of the hypothesis, that there is a coarsely tuned universe. But we might think that it is improbable given the falsity of the hypothesis, that there is a finely tuned universe, which would call for an explanation. But it just seems like now you're now you're just talking about different theories. You're testing different theories, whether or not uh, they predict our, our observations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, different theories about our specific evidence. Yeah, but we're talking about. Uh, but I'm asking you about the multiverse hypothesis. Yeah. So you can't just start uh, talking about how other theories uh, can predict or. Um, wouldn't expect to see certain states of affairs in order to somehow explain um, my, in order to somehow address my question about the multiverse um, hypothesis, right? I'm asking you how the uh, observations relate to the multiverse hypothesis, not how they relate to other hypotheses or theories. Yeah, because I can look at my background theories and my background theories might say that given the falsity of the multiverse hypothesis, it's improbable that I have the specific observation that I'm trying to explain. Now it just saying that now it just seems like you're saying, oh well, those are what are going to explain our observations. No, what explains our observation is the multiverse. Then why appeal to the other hypotheses? Because our other hypotheses tell us whether our observations are probable or improbable given the truth or falsity of the multiverse hypothesis. But it seems like, uh, it, I mean, if it's a case that it's unfalsifiable, the multiverse hypothesis, then it will uh, be compatible with any uh, theory as well. No, it won't. There might be one theory which entails that there isn't a multiverse. Right, so what, what observation does it say that would confirm that? That would confirm it? Do you mean that would, like, yes. entail it? No, what observation that, if a true, would be evidence supporting that theory? The multiverse theory. No, the one that you said uh, wouldn't posit the multiverse. All of the evidence that we have that might posit a theory like that. I'm not a so, physicist. No, no. The, the point there is that if you identify that observation, that would be an observation that would go against the multiverse hypothesis. So it would show that the multiverse hypothesis can be disconfirmed, and so it wouldn't be an example of an unfalsifiable or uh, non-disconfirmable hypothesis. Yeah, not necessarily, right? Because maybe the observation that we have is compatible with the multiverse. It's just improbable given the multiverse. So it might just be evidence against the multiverse, even though it wouldn't rule it. Yeah, but just saying something's evidence against the multiverse is saying that um, it could be disconfirmed. No, it's just to say it's improbable. Wait a minute. Uh, saying something is improbable wouldn't say isn't saying that the evidence doesn't raise the probability of that something of that hypothesis just joe can you repeat that so are you saying <laughs> see the thing is is that we're talking about what would make it uh what would be evidence that would raise the probability of hypotheses right and if it's yeah, a case like this yeah so it, now it just sounds like you think that there can be evidence against the multiverse hypothesis. No, I don't. It's unfalsifiable. I can't observe not a multiverse. So how can you have uh, theories that uh, would contradict it? Maybe you can't. I'm not a physicist. 
No, but the thing is, if you're saying it's unfalsifiable, then you're saying that you can't have theories that contradict it. No, all that I'm saying is that it's compatible with any observation. Right, so you're saying that you can't have theories that contradict it. No, uh, that contradict it. No, they couldn't contradict it, but they could be. Imp they could make the universe, the multiverse, sorry, improbable. Right. So that means that they uh, they expect states of affairs, right? And so, if you think that uh, one theory uh, would make the multiverse improbable, then you're identifying a theory that makes the multiverse improbable. That that theory expects certain states of affairs. So all you have to say is that if we see those states of affairs, that would make the multiverse hypothesis um, improbable. It would be evidence against it. Right, but it wouldn't rule out the multiverse. The multiverse could still be compatible with that observation or with that theory. Wait, did you hear what I said? Sorry. Yeah, what you said is that if we had one of these other theories that would seem to, um, you know, could that rule out the multiverse? And that would just make the multiverse falsifiable. But I don't think so, right? The multiverse is compatible with any observation. Just it might be that there are certain observations that are improbable given the multiverse. How can it be compatible with any observation and improbable with certain observations? Yeah, but there's no connection between whether something is compatible or probable, right? It could be fully compatible. Uh, a particular observation might be fully compatible with an observation, but improbable or probable. Um, Fish, th uh, what about this? Just think about there's some, there's some thing we do, like we flip a coin and it gets heads. Or just no. Let's let's do the to the total set of affairs that exist um, that we can observe. All observations. Let's say there's some theory, and on its truth, the total set of observations is predicted with eighty percent likelihood, and on its falsity, the total set of observations is predicted with twenty percent likelihood. Don't you think that in that instance, even though the total um, set of observations is compatible with either side of this theory? that since it's predicted with a higher likelihood on the truth of the theory, that that would count as evidence for the theory? Yeah, the thing is, is that when I asked him, like, uh, about this uh, probability raising the likelihood of a hypothesis being true, he said that every state of affairs uh, raises it to one, not just 80%, but 100%. <clears throat> now, what I said is that given the truth of the hypothesis, the um, fact that there'll be every state of affairs is one. Not that given any observation, the probability that there will be the hypothesis. I don't, I don't see the difference between that and what I said. Yeah, it sounds to me like what Joe is criticizing is just the mechanism by which we would even be able to do prior estimation given non-falsifiable hypotheses. You know, I don't see why that's a problem. We can just look at our background beliefs and say that given this unfalsifiable hypothesis, certain observations are probable or improbable. Yeah, but where does that probability come from? It comes from our background beliefs. Right, but I think that that, that would just be reducing or shifting the issue to discussing those background beliefs, which I think are you know, actually going to be the crux of the issue then. And then those would have to be falsifiable for us to be able to construct that prior estimation. So all, all that's happening there, right, is you're just shifting from the multiverse theory to some other discussion. Yeah, this is something I pointed out before when he said, well, we would have to look at our, our other theories in, uh, you know, in physics. The thing is, is that you're just saying, look, we're going to look at these other theories now. Yeah, and that, I'm trying to ask you about the, the multiverse theory. Yeah, that, I, think that, I think at that point, it, you wouldn't even be having like a cosmogenic discussion anymore. You would be discussing cosmology, so the actual state of the universe. And so the problem is, is any cosmological view, like we've already discussed, is just going to be 
compatible with the multiverse theory, but it's also compatible, you know, with God's fine tuning or whatever. Um, give, given that you know the multiverse theory actually is unfalsifiable. But if if that's what we're doing, then we're no longer discussing the multiverse theory. We're discussing cosmology. What Joe asked me was how you you determine that the fine tuned universe is improbable or probable. Yeah. And the way that you do that is by looking at background beliefs. I don't see how that does that. That's how physics works. That's how all of our knowledge works. But, um, like in physics, those things aren't taken to be non-falsifiable. But the multiverse theory is falsifiable. Maybe there are other theories that are falsifiable. I don't Wait, know. Hold on. Hold on. Time out. You think the multiverse is falsifiable? No, it isn't falsifiable. <laughs> <laughs> you just like admitted the exact opposite. No, I said okay. that it isn't falsifiable. Yeah, I get okay. If you if you if you like yeah. misspoke, I get it. But yeah, you just I think you, mis you misspoke. You did say falsifiable, and so. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you just misspoke, that's that's fair. Uh, yeah, it's I'll it's no that. big deal. It's no big deal. But I would... but I think I think the issue is is and I think Joe and I agree here. Maybe we're just missing something. Um, I don't understand. It, how, it, just sounds, um, it just sounds like you're switching to a different theory at that point. You're just discussing something else. You're no longer. Yeah, it's, not even that. it's just I don't even know. I don't even know what role background beliefs are supposed to play because presumably, on an unfalsifiable theory, uh, even if that theory is false, uh, uh, let's just say de facto, for the sake of argument, if that theory is false and some other theory is true, but it's also unfalsifiable, then you could have all the same background beliefs. So I don't understand why it would count in favor of one over the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's sort of what I was trying to get at, right? It's just that it doesn't even seem like prior estimation with respect to a non-falsifiable hypothesis is even something you can do. Because no, we're not talking about like prior you, estimation. Like you just pointed out, background beliefs you misunderstood me. You've misunderstood me. I didn't say that prior estimation is going to determine the probability of an unfalsifiable hypothesis. What I said is that prior estimation is going to determine the probability of particular observations given the truth or falsity of the hypothesis. Yeah, I don't see that how that would allow us to select between non-falsifiable hypotheses, though. Well, because then we might say that hypothesis A predicts observation X with 80% likelihood, and that hypothesis B predicts observation X with 20% likelihood, which, and, and then in that case, um, observation X would be evidence for hypothesis A. I don't think it does that. I think at uh, best what you're doing is just some form of induction there towards uh, these background knowledges, but that doesn't say anything about the multiverse theory itself. Well, wait, someone correct me please if, we're, if I'm wrong, but is not what we're talking about there just abduction? I mean, it seems like we're going for like kind of like inference to the best, best explanation and we don't have like observation there. So we're just saying like, look, if this theory is true, the observation is predicted with this amount of likelihood. If this theory is false, it's predicted with this amount of likelihood, it happened. So if I have to bank on whether the theory that predicts it stronger or weaker is true, I'd go on the one that predicts it stronger. The question is how you're countenancing the probability there, right? So the, the, it's really what's the feature of these background beliefs? Because these background beliefs I mean, it sounds like a, a dormative virtue, really, right? Like you're just saying these background beliefs are make this more likely because they make it more likely, but there's no explanation as to in virtue of what they in fact make it more likely, right? So the idea is just like, if those background beliefs are literally consistent with every possible observation and, and, and any possible world, in fact, right? How, how could it be the case? I mean, obviously indexed to whether or not you have those beliefs. But how could it be the case that they actually count in favor of uh, the truth of a hypothesis, whether it's true or false? Because well, right. they have the same properties right. even when it's false. Yeah, I, I don't have a super strong view here. Like, all, all that I'm saying is, like, let's just take an extreme example. Just say that there's hypothesis A. And if hypothesis A is true, then observation X is predicted with, like, 99% likelihood. And if, if uh, hypothesis A is false then observation X is predicted with like 0.00000001% likelihood. Am I going to bank on the fact that some extremely unlikely thing happened or that something more likely happened? And that's sort of, I mean, talking about 80 and 20, you're just narrowing the range, but it's most obvious when you talk about an extreme case like that. 
you're cutting out. You're roboting really bad, but like, I think the idea with abduction is that we already just have the observation. We're trying to figure out what's the best explanation of it. We're not trying to figure out what's the likelihood of just that explanation of that observation occurring. Well, you like, asked me how we. It's did. already. Well, hold on a second. Um, I was asking you how, uh, given that observation, um, it would raise the likelihood of uh, one hypothesis being true, right? Because given the hypothesis, it might be 99.999% certain that there'd be that observation. I mean, the thing is, is that you think since it's unfalsifiable, it's it's even higher. It's just so one that we would in have. The, in the case of the multiverse, it is one. But it doesn't have to be one. It could be a lot of that. Right, so I don't see how that really explains it. If it's just uh, always going to be true. It's not always going to be true. It might be false. But you just said that there's no state of affairs uh, that would, uh, if true, would um, falsify the multiverse hypothesis. So how could it be false? Fish, can I just ask you a question? I, I just don't get this. What is your response to this point right here? Just say that there's theory A and there's the total set of observations, which we're just going to refer to as X. Now, say that the total set of observations is predicted on the truth and on the falsity of uh, hypothesis A, but on the truth of hypothesis A, it's predicted with 99.999% likelihood, and on the falsity of hypothesis A, it's predicted with 0.0000001% likelihood. Would you sooner bank on the truth or falsity of hypothesis A, given that banking on the on the falsity of it suggests that some extremely improbable thing happened? I mean, I'm not really sure what you're you're just asking me which hypothesis I would go with. It would be the one that uh, that goes with the higher likelihood. Okay, well then I think that you would be accepting Insup's point if you're agreeing to that, though. Yeah, but the thing is, Insult is saying that there is no such comparison. It's just they're all the same uh, likelihood. You're not comparing uh, 0 0.99999 to, uh, to an observation of something that's 0 0.00000. You're, you're comparing uh, just like a 1.0 to 1.0 to 1.0. Right. What we were talking about was was explanatory power. Well, hold on. Does power. that does that make sense? Ask yourself. Yeah. Right. So, like, you're not. There's no way to make any adjudication there. That's for explanatory power. Right. When we're talking about explanatory power, there's going to have to be some difference in the probability that we have observation X. But that wouldn't be the case with other explanatory virtues. Thing is, is that there is no difference. But there is, right? Because I can look at my background beliefs and I can say, if the, there's no multiverse, it's improbable that I have a finely tuned universe. But if there is a multiverse, it's not improbable that I have a finely tuned universe. So that's just a statement of explanatory power. That's just to say the multiverse theory has high explanatory power, even though it's unfalsifiable. So. Uh, I'm confused at how you got that probability again. If you just agreed with you. me, <laughs> if you just agreed with me, if you just agreed with me that uh, the probability of X is just one in every single scenario. How did I get that? That's just what the hypothesis is. That's what it says. Right. If the if the multiverse is true, there's an infinite number of universes. So there's an infinite amount of variation, so the probability that there's a finely tuned universe is one. That just, con that just um, conceptually follows from the hypothesis. Yeah, then I don't see how it is. I mean, if every, uh, 
I mean, if any other observation also conceptually follows from the hypothesis, I don't see how it's an explanation. Because given the falsity of the hypothesis, it might be improbable that we have that observation. I think that this can help narrow it down. Like here's just the same question, but in writing. Okay, so just in general. So there's just three points and then a question, right? So the first point is A, which is a hypothesis, predicts X with 99.9% .9 likelihood. Not A predicts X with, you know, 0.0001% likelihood. We observe X. Would you bank on A or not A being true? Yeah, well, I bank on A. Yeah. Yeah. No. No, but remember what I said though. There's I mean that no matter anything you can supplement for X. Right? So it wouldn't be evidence that uh would move the hy multiverse hypothesis or um hypothesis A in your example. Uh to the truth, it wouldn't raise the likelihood of the hypothesis fish, A fish. being true. J just replace X with the total set of observations. Yeah, right. I think um, if it was to raise the probability, um, it would. It's kind of like um, affirming the consequent. So I don't think it would raise the probability. Yeah, you know, Joe, it sounds like you're agreeing with me that we can use explanatory power as a um as a way to determine what we should believe in. I'm glad we made some progress. Well, I mean it's like what Brennan and I said. It just sounds like you're you're ducking out of the multiverse hypothesis and just trying to adjudicate between other hypotheses. I'm adjudicating between the hypothesis of which one of them is the multiverse hypothesis. Um, yeah, but the thing is, is how do you adjudicate between them? If yeah, uh, look at one of them being true would mean that there's evidence going against the multiverse hypothesis, which you deny. One of them being true wouldn't count as evidence against the multiverse hypothesis. It just might mean that there's evidence which is improbable given the multiverse hypothesis. Or, or sorry, it might mean that there's an observation which um, counts as evidence in favor of a theory which makes the multiverse hypothesis improbable. Right, so that just seems like you're saying there could be evidence against the multiverse hypothesis, so it can be disconfirmed. No, it could be ruled out. Right, so all I was talking about from the very beginning was uh, whether or not you can have evidence for or against it. If you just agree this entire time that you can have evidence going against the multiverse hypothesis, then uh, it's confusing. I'm, I'm confused as to why you said that we couldn't have observations that would um, rule out the multiverse hypothesis. Yeah, because you can't observe not a multiverse, but you can have abductive evidence for or against it. There might be a better explanation than the multiverse hypothesis. Abductive evidence is just you already have the evidence. What's the best explanation for it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's going to be conception. Right. So if uh, if it's unfalsifiable or um, if it's if you can't disconfirm it, then you're saying you can't have evidence against it. So it wouldn't be a part of that abductive. Um, adjudication. You can't have observational evidence against it, but you could have abductive evidence in the, against it in the form of a better explanation. Better explanation of what? Of the observation that we're trying to explain. You just said that you can't have observations. That would be evidence. Against... Right, because you can't observe not a multiverse. Right, so uh, how can you say it's the best explanation of something? If, uh, if if there can't be any uh, like uh, evidence for it. because hypothesis A might be more probable. Give, uh, sorry, um, observation X might be more probable given the hypothesis than its alternatives. But you just said that there. 
you just said that there is no observation that you can use to disconfirm it. Yeah, nothing, nothing observational because you couldn't observe and not a multiverse. Yeah, so then you can't you can't haggle between the best explanation for a set of hypotheses uh, for a set of evidence. Yes, you can. Well, look, look, I'm not. This whole thing is sort of a confusion. So when you say something is a better uh, explanation, presumably you want to say in virtue of coherence with our background beliefs. That's but one explanatory. Yeah, well, that's one. Okay, we can. I mean, we can set aside uh, the other examples, but I mean, this is the one that you were appealing to most recently, was uh, coherence with our background beliefs. But the point is that if it's unfalsifiable, all of those beliefs could still be true. That is to say, uh, whatever we believe about uh, the universe or the world in which we're in, uh, those could all be true. And um, it, the thing could still be false, right? So it's not as if those count in favor. They don't have any property that counts in favor. Yeah, they're compatible given the truth of the hypothesis, but they might be probable or improbable given the truth or falsity of the hypothesis. The question is in virtue of what are they probable or I, I don't understand the question. Okay, so you when you say something is probable, you can say in virtue of such and such, this is probable and, and uh, not in virtue of something else. So there has to be some property that they have that makes it such that they would be, uh, they make something else more probable or less probable, right? So I'm asking what that property is. Yeah, the reasons for and against, which could take the form of observational evidence or abductive evidence, um, or like maybe conceptual entailment. Sorry, I'm in the middle of so I'll respond. Yeah, I didn't hear that. You're right. Uh, you're having some audio problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All that I said, Joe, was that you couldn't have observational evidence against the multiverse because you can't observe not a multiverse. But you could have abductive evidence against it in the form of a better explanation. It just might be unfalsifiable with respect to what you can observe. So I kind of feel like you were equivocating by observational evidence and um, abductive evidence. But like you were kind of conflating those two. I mean something specific when I say observational evidence and another specific thing. Uh, another distinct thing when I say abductive evidence. Uh, I don't understand what it sounds to me like you're saying abductive evidence is appealing to the explanatory virtues that um, an explanation may or may not have. Mm -hmm. And I consider that to be distinct from what you can observe. So you can't observe not a multiverse. But there might be a better explanation for what we are observing than the multiverse, which would count against the multiverse. Right. So it just seems like now you're you're disputing between uh, these things a priori. That is, if it's a case that they um, are explanations that can be offered to explain the set of data, then we would adjudicate between these explanations given these uh, virtues. That's what abductive reasoning is. Right, and so my concern was uh, the fact that you couldn't even get there with, uh, the, with um, explanations that uh, you couldn't disconfirm. But you can. You can't disconfirm the multiverse, but maybe certain observations are more probable or more improbable given the truth of the hypothesis. And then you can look at explanatory power. That's one. That's one explanatory virtue that you've got on the table. It, um, explanatory scope doesn't even require that, right? It, um, maybe one hypothesis explains something completely unrelated to our specific evidence, right? Just a, a, another background belief that we don't currently have an explanation for. 
that would count in favor of that particular hypothesis, even though it isn't even related to the explanandum. I, um, I don't understand where you get this probability calculus then. It's a priori. It's all conceptual. That's what abductive reasoning is. How can you say that it's um, a priori uh, improbable or probable in terms of explanatory scope? Because it's supposed to be explaining the facts. It's a posteriori. Well, it's explaining the a posteriori facts in an a priori way. We aren't observing not a multiverse, right? We're just kind of leaning back in our armchairs and thinking about what the best explanation is for what we observe. There just seems like you're saying something trivial. If it's a case that it has explanatory scope, then it has that, um, that virtue. Yeah, and that counts in favor of the hypothesis. Right, but just the issue is, is that uh, if it's unfalsifiable, it wouldn't have explanatory scope. That's not true. It might be completely unfalsifiable, but it might explain evidence that other unfalsifiable theories don't explain. Well, if, if it doesn't explain it, it just seems like it's evident. It wouldn't be evidence for those theories, so they would be disconfirmable. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what you just said. Like, I don't see how you can uh, talk about explanatory scope a priori, because it seems to me like you're saying this hypothesis more of the evidence, right? Mm -hmm. And that's going to be conceptual. The way that we determine that, I mean, is conceptual. Of course, the evidence that we have is going to be empirical evidence that we've observed. Right, so that seems a posteriori. Well, the evidence is, the evidence gathering, that's a, that's a posteriori. But to determine what has higher explanatory scope is a priori. Right, that's not something that you can observe. You have to sit back in an armchair and determine that. Well, don't you have to say, well, it explains this evidence and that evidence and this evidence? Mm -hmm. So that's not a priori that requires you to um, go out and examine the world. I already said that. You've got to gather evidence, and then you've got to sit back in your armchair, and you've got to say, well, which of these theories explains the evidence, uh, explains more of the evidence or less of the evidence that we've just gathered? And that's just scope, right? There are other virtues. Yeah, it seems like it just seems like you would have to say that this is evidence that supports the theory if you think that um, it's explained by the theory. It's abductive evidence. It's not, it's not observational evidence, though, because you can't observe not a multiverse. You also can't observe the multiverse. It's not observable. Um, so the, the issue that I'm having is that we're talking about... Um, just explanations in general, then you go into the specifics with the multiverse. Uh, and it seems to me like multiverse just wouldn't have explanatory scope, right? Because you've been insisting on our inability to appeal to observations to show that there's evidence for or against the multiverse hypothesis. But um, I, so I don't see why you would bring up the multiverse hypothesis when you're talking about explanatory scope which says that we can appeal to our observations and say that an explanation um, explains uh, more of our observations independent of the ones they were set out to explain. Yeah, well, in the case of the multiverse, um, it might explain our specific evidence, i.e. fine-tuning, but it might also explain the way that gravity is or something like that. I'm not a physicist, but it, it might explain something completely unrelated. That would be higher, then it would be higher in explanatory scope. So wait a minute, can we say that the multiverse hypothesis explains observations or what? Uh, well, that's what it means to obduce. I'm 
I'm sorry? That, that's what it means to offer an explanation. Right, but if I said, so there's, <laughs> yeah, but if, uh, if one of our observations was a single universe, uh, you denied even the possibility of doing that. Mm -hmm. Because we wouldn't be in a universe that wasn't finely tuned. And we can't stand outside of the multiverse and say, oh, look, there's a multiverse, or oh, look, there isn't a multiverse here. Yeah, I just don't see if it doesn't if it doesn't raise the probability of the hypothesis being true. I don't even see how an observation how you could say an observation is uh, evidence for that hypothesis. But we like Isaac just gave a good example earlier of how explanatory scope could do that. Right? And you agreed that it would work as evidence. No, no, the thing is is that I agree to the scenario he gave. But I said that that scenario wasn't the one that you're offering. The one that you're offering is having the same probability for um, any observation across the board. Well, if it's got the same abductive probability across the board, then you know you've just got to stalemate that. Yeah. So it doesn't seem like it would. It explains anything. So it wouldn't be an explanation that you would try and, uh, you know, make sense of abductively. Well, it, it would be an explanation that explained the explanandum. It's just that there would be many other explanations that did it just as well. So that's just basically like the quantum mechanics situation that we have right now. You know, just, you, you just pick your favorite one. Right. How do you, it seems like uh, people want to say that uh, there are, there is a set of evidence that uh, these different views of quantum mechanics explain. And then they would say, there's a reason why this view of quantum mechanics is a better explanation by doing what you and I like to do, which is appealing to explanatory virtues. Yeah, I, I'm not a physicist, but uh, as I understand it, there's basically just a stalemate. Um, with respect to quantum mechanics, because yeah, maybe some of them explain you know different pieces of evidence better than others, but they're all basically equal in total virtues. So these are this is a stalemate between different explanations. Um, I thought that it was a I thought that. The stalemate that I identified was a stalemate between different observations that would be evidence for a single explanation. So I think that that's not comparable to the stalemate between explanations and quantum mechanics. Well, if all observations are equally probable given the truth of a hypothesis, then you couldn't use the virtue of explanatory power in order to determine whether that was a good hypothesis or not. Exactly. Yeah, that's just one ex explanatory virtue that you couldn't use, but you could still use others. Like what? Um, degree of ad hocness. Um, how do you understand ad hoc without uh, appealing to observations that would go against the hypothesis? Well, it's just a kind of artificiality or contrivance to fit the data. Right. So the idea with ad hoc is that uh, you're putting out fires, that uh, your your initial hypothesis um, didn't like uh, think about. It wasn't prepared for. Right. The way you get out of that is uh, you can revise your hypothesis, and those revisions uh, generate further predictions. But ad hoc hypotheses are revisions that don't generate further predictions. But that's all in virtue of finding evidence that would uh, undermine your initial hypothesis. But if it's uh, unfalsifiable, you're not going to find any such evidence. So you wouldn't even well, be well, able to say. Like, that there might be abductive evidence that, um, that's caused a fire for one particular theory. 
but that and then that theory needs to be revised in an ad hoc way to compensate. It might not be observational. But I don't, I don't, Joe, I don't really, I, I, had, oh, I don't even know if I really want to continue on this because now it just sounds like we're going to get into some kind of um, really nitpicky discussion about each and every explanatory virtue. All that I want to point out is that it can be rational to believe in an explanation even if that theory isn't falsifiable. And you basically agreed. You, you agreed with hypothesis A and hypothesis B on observation X. That was, you agreed with the idea of explanatory power. So again, <laughs> again, the thing is, is that uh, you're saying that unfalsifiable hypotheses aren't uh, the equivalent to the scenario that was given, right? Because on unfalsifiable hypotheses, X doesn't generate different uh, probabilities. It generates the same probability. And if that's the case, then like, I don't agree with you. Well, then it's unfalsifiable with respect to explanatory power, but there are other virtues. And I, and I don't want to get into a nitpicky discussion about what those other virtues are. I see. So predictive power, that wouldn't be one of the virtues, right? Well, when you say predictive power, I think you just mean explanatory power, right? You just mean how probable is this observation given the truth of the hypothesis? And, and that is a virtue. Now, if you stipulate that actually all of the theories are equivalent with respect to their explanatory power, then yeah, they're unfalsifiable with respect to that virtue. Now you need to move to different virtues. Yeah, I didn't understand that. Um, okay, I'll just repeat what, uh, again. So, if you stipulate that all of the theories are equivalent with respect to explanatory power, i.e. all observations are equally probable given the truth of all of our uh, theories, then in that case all of the theories are unfalsifiable with respect to explanatory power. But there are other virtues that they might be um, uh, falsifiable or verifiable with respect to. So it seems like I think that explanatory power only speaks to the set of data you're trying to explain. So um, presumably there still is data that's not positive to explain, so they wouldn't be unfalsifiable. Uh, I didn't understand that. Right, so explanatory scope is talking about um, observations that, it's a build that um, not only um, does the hypothesis proposed to explain in the first place, but are independent um, from those observations that the hypothesis was proposed to explain. And it's in different domains. There's different domains of evidence that it also explains. That's explanatory scope. Right, you said explanatory power. So explanatory power, and I have not seen. No, I, I mean different, uh, I may have misspoke. Explanatory power is just how probable is the specific evidence that we have given the truth of the hypothesis. Explanatory scope is just how much evidence does it explain? And that could be in completely different domains. It might be, it might be unrelated evidence. And you're saying that unfalsifiable um, explanations just wouldn't compete because they don't raise the likelihood of that evidence being true. If you stipulate that given the truth of any of the theories that you have, the observation that you have that you're trying to adjudicate on is equally probable, then you can't use explanatory power. Yeah, right. But you could still use explanatory scope and degree of ad hocness and coherence with background beliefs. And all of the uh, the other explanatory virtues that are proposed. There's there's lots of them. I don't see how there could be ad hocness if it's consistent with all states of affairs. No, I don't. I don't want to get into a nitpicky discussion about each and every virtue, Joe. I, I just want to point out that you know you could can you have explain an that though. Could you explain how there could be like something could be ad hoc if it's consistent with all states of affairs? No, I don't even want to think about it. Why would you say that? that would be a virtue that you could still appeal to for unfalsifiable hypotheses. I mean, it's, it's just consensus, like science. I don't even want to think about what that would be. I, I don't want to get in, I, like I said, I don't want to get into the weeds here. 
I want to stick to the main point that you can have a theory which posits something unobservable, but you could still be rational or irrational to believe it, given abductive concerns. I didn't understand your answer to the ad hoc thing. It's a consensus science that you can have, you could talk about ad hocness with the theories where all states of affairs are consistent with that theory. I don't even want to discuss it. I don't, oh, okay. So I don't see why you would say that that would be one of the explanatory virtues you could use to pick a unfalsifiable explanation over any other. I, I don't care. Right. So the it just seems like we we could actually go through every single explanatory virtue, uh, every single explanatory virtue, and uh, demonstrate how uh, unfalsifiable explanation just isn't going to do anything, even within the domain of each of these explanatory virtues. So I don't see how like it doesn't seem like they would already they. <laughs> They don't seem like they can compete because they don't predict any um, evidence that we would uh, claim that it tries to explain when we're doing abductive reasoning. Well, that's explanatory power. And I've already said, if they're equivalent with respect to explanatory power, then you can't use explanatory power. Yeah, and so it doesn't seem like you can use degree of ad hocness. It also didn't seem like you could use simplicity. It also seems like the um, coherence of background beliefs was just shifting to talking about other things than the theory at hand. Well, if you, if you just stipulate that for any given virtue, all of the theories that we have on some particular observation, are uh, that all of the theories are equivalently virtuous, then I'll agree that you've just got to stalemate that. But I don't see why that would be interesting. I'm not saying they're equivalently virtuous. I'm saying I don't understand how unfalsifiable theory can even compete. No, I don't understand how you don't understand that. Well, in part, you said we, you given, didn't want to bother explaining it to me. We've given the example of the multiverse hypothesis, which is unfalsifiable with respect to what you can observe, because you can't observe it or not observe it. You can't get outside the universe. And we've just said that certain observations might be more probable with respect to the um, multiverse hypothesis, giving it explanatory power. Right, so that would be an unfalsifiable uh, theory that it could still be rational to believe in. Now, if you just stipulate, well, what about if it, the explanatory power was equivalent? You know, I don't know. I don't even want to talk about that. That's not germane to my general point. So that's not, that's not what I stipulated. What I stipulated was issues with having a uh, a theory where all states of affairs are consistent with it um, being judged by these various explanatory powers. And I showed that they... there were problems, or you didn't bother uh, explaining why it's not a problem for these given explanatory virtues. Are they all equivalently possible, or are they all equivalently probable? The observations for... Yeah, the observations... The... Um, it's just uh, each state of affairs is uh, it's consistent with the um, hypothesis. Yeah, but they some of them might be less or more probable. So then you'd just be able to use explanatory power. Well, it seems like if you're saying it could be less or more probable, then you're saying that there could be evidence against the hypothesis. Abductive evidence, not observational evidence. We're talking about an unobservable here. Do you feel the same thing about other theoretical um, unobservable? I'm not a physicist, I don't know. Well, the thing is, is uh, usually when theoretical unobservables are posited, what happens is you posit, like um, you also get sufficient reasons for positing something novel like a theoretical unobservable. I haven't heard any of that um, in the case of the multiverse. So I don't see why, uh, you know, just saying, well, it's a theoretical unobservable, so I don't have to worry about that, um, helps the issue at all. 
But what I don't have to worry about is the question of whether I can directly observe it or whether I can directly observe that it's not there. So I can't, I can't have observational evidence for or against. It's unfalsifiable with respect to that. But there could still be abductive reasons to believe it. So what would be those reasons? The explanatory virtues that we've been talking about. Uh, but aren't those predicated upon uh, the explanation actually explaining things? That's one. But if everything's compatible with it, how can it explain anything? Because certain observations might be more or less probable, given the truth or falsity of the hypothesis. That would lead to certain theories having higher or lower explanatory power. But if it's unfalsifiable, you're you're just saying that that latter probability that will never obtain. No, I'm not. You're not. Then you can identify an observation that would go against the hypothesis. I could identify an observation which might provide abductive support to theory which would render the multiverse theory improbable. Have something like that. Oh well, then you just then you do agree that there could be evidence against it. Abductive evidence. Um, I want to raise Bryn's criticism here. So Bryn is saying he thinks it's impossible for certain things to have higher or lower degrees of po probability on the truth or falsity of an unfalsifiable theory. Yeah, I don't see why that's true. There could be all kinds of reasons that you might think. Um, an unfalsifiable theory is more or less probable. Maybe just its plausibility with respect to you know, background beliefs, just like the credence or the intuition that you have on it. That would give you a reason. I don't know if you guys want to keep going on this topic. Fish, did you have things you wanted to say on the interpretation argument while you have uh, in sub's attention because maybe that would be worth raising also i know you wanted to talk about it did you guys talk about the interpretation argument in sub um yeah i think i talked about it with vic or somebody else i can't remember exactly right so the argument says that uh, interpreting the utterances of an agent is just inferring their intentions right and it says that uh, people who say that they've accurately interpreted the Bible, they're saying that they've accurately inferred the intentions of God. But the problem is, is that uh, it doesn't seem like they've offered any uh, criteria that would allow them to make such a claim. And so the argument asks, what is that? Uh, what are those uh, interpretive rules? Or principles or the criteria that you use to justify your interpretation of God's word, be it in the Bible, Quran, whatever, well, what are the, um, just, what's the justification for your interpretation of those divine utterances um, to say that they actually align with uh, God's intentions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's a, an interesting argument. Um... I think that there's two, at least two ways for the theist to go. Uh, sorry, the first way would be to say that their justification for believing in um, their particular interpretation is non-inferential, and then they just don't need to give an inferential reason. The other way would be to say that they have background beliefs on the table about God, which to um, adjudicate the probability of certain uh, beliefs and intentions of God being true or false. So uh, I think we can get rid of the, the non-inferential one if I just clarify the language. It's asking for like a rational justification, right? The theist will just and, say that that's rational. Well, the, the one issue also there is that it doesn't seem like you're able to show that your interpretation is above any other one that just um, has non-inferential uh, views that are opposite yours 
right? So yeah. we want to like a we want to figure out, um, you know, how to show that the, um, this theist, not yours specifically, but a theist interpretation is the one that um, more accurately, um, uh, you know, demonstrates God's intentions. And so appealing to just non-inferential things would be begging the question to get someone who just has different non-inferential um, like reasons to support their interpretation of God's word. Now, the second one you said appealing to the background information with God, but I don't see how you can uh, identify something that would be background um, information or experience with God um, that either wouldn't be begging the question or it doesn't seem like it's actually available to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with, with the non-inferential one, um, I don't think it would be begging the question for the theist to appeal to their own non-inferential justification, right? The fact that somebody else has different non-inferential justification doesn't make your justification question begging. It would only be question begging if you tried to convince them by using a justification that they couldn't use, right? But if, if I was a theist, I'd just say... That's all I mean, just, though. That's all I mean, though. Yeah, but I don't. Okay, but if I was a theist, this is what I would say. I would say I don't care about what those other people non-inferentially believe. I have non-inferential justification for my interpretation to believe uh, to believe that my interpretation is true, and that their interpretation is false. And I'm just not concerned about what they think. And then I would leave it there. Right now, it seems like at that point, for me. I've just diffused the objection for me. I understand that there's still a problem if you want to say that your interpretation is better than all of the other people's interpretation. Yeah, but that's I, the I, argument I the... about, it's not about, it's asking like, you know, what would be the rational reason? But the theist would just say that their non-inferential justification is rational. Um, the thing is, it's like, would it be persuasive if someone just went up and said, well, I have the opposite, non-inferential justification? If I were a theist, I'd say I don't care. Right. Yeah, it, but the thing is, is that the whole point of the, I thought the whole point of the argument was to like undercut the, uh, the theist's own interpretation and say, well, because you, um, you can't you know, check whether or not God believes certain things or desires certain things, you're just not justified in believing in your particular interpretation. But the theist can just say, well, I'm not concerned about convincing other theists with this. That's not that's not my problem. I just have non-inferential justification for my particular interpretation, and then they could just leave it there. No, the, the argument is going against people who do care about demonstrating their interpretation is the accurate one. Okay, so if, if I were a theist and I just said that, you would just say, okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's only against people who uh, claim that they have rational reasons uh, supporting their interpretation of God's word. Yeah. Okay, but I just like want to be clear. If, if, you say, if you say to me as a theist, hey, the interpretation argument, and then I say, well, my interpretation is non-inferentially justified, so I can be rational and believe my interpretation, and be rational and believe that all of the other theists' interpretation is false, and then I can say I'm not concerned about convincing other theists. At that point, will you just say, okay, this argument doesn't apply to you? Yeah, it's only about people who want to say that they have the most accurate interpretation. Okay, but that, right? yeah, yeah, sure. So you, you would, just to be clear, you would say, okay, fine. Yeah, I don't think that they would be able to uh, move forward in the discussion because their interpretation, they would have to concede, is like on par with any other interpretation that's based on non-inferential justification. Well, maybe they'd say that they're non-inferentially justified to believe that everybody else is mistaken, so it's actually not on par. But then they'd say, I'm just not concerned about convincing others about that. Yeah, so again, like, that's something that's also just available to, like, your, to other people saying yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, obviously, they can also say that. But yeah. they, then, then, then I would just say as a theist, I don't care about what, they, what those fools say. Yeah, so the argument's just 
focusing on people who do care. Okay. But yeah, I'm just pointing out, like, if I was a theist, I mean, I'm just going to be cool with my non-inferentially justified interpretation. So if I'm guy, okay, we, go, we agree on that. Now, with respect to this other thing, um, I, I forgot what you what your reply was to the point about getting background beliefs on the table about God. Can you just repeat that? No, like, I'm just what the whole thing is. I don't think that you can, you have any background experience with God to appeal to. Okay, well, maybe I've got a sound ontological argument which shows that God is necessarily morally perfect. And then I can deduce from that that God um, doesn't hate everybody. So I've just ruled out one interpretation, which is that God hates everybody. Um, well, there's two things. I don't see how that rules out an interpretation. Uh, the other thing is uh, the argument actually grants a lot, right? It grants a God who. Uh, means something when it makes utterances and it grants a god that um, is infallible right and all knowing perfectly good that kind of thing well look, i'll just i'll just pretend to be a theist right so maybe there's one guy who's reading the bible and he's his interpretation is that god hates everybody this is a hateful being right and you say to me how do you rule out that guy's interpretation what reason do you have and then if I was a theist, I'd say, well, here's my sound ontological argument, which shows that God is necessarily morally perfect. So that can't be the right interpretation. I mean, you're just saying that guy's mistaken, right? Yeah, but that's what you asked me for. You asked me for a reason to think that the other interpretations were false, and I just gave you one. No, I was just clarifying. You're saying that guy's mistaken. Yeah, yeah, that guy's mistaken because I've got a, I've got a sound ontological argument. Yeah, I don't see how it follows that he would be mistaken. Well, because it's a priori that being hateful is wrong. Yeah, but uh, I don't understand how you're ruling out uh, God uh, having intentions to write a book that would make it so people get that impression from the book, right? Well, then it God might would be, be a deceiver. That... Yeah, what's wrong with that? Because I've got a sound ontological argument which shows that God can't be a deceiver because God is necessarily a perfect being. I don't see why being a perfect being makes it so you wouldn't um, have theological aims. Because it's a priori that deceivers are not perfect beings. Why not? That's the view of me, a theist. Yeah, you would have to argue that. Well, I just said it's a priori and then basically everybody agrees with it. Yeah, you're asking for, the thing is, is that the, the ontological argument or modal ontological argument, too, doesn't establish that. The other thing is, uh, I don't see how that, I mean, the thing is, you're just saying that God, by definition, cannot deceive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got a sound ontological argument to show that that's the case. And then we have this guy who's interpreted the Bible in such a way so that he thinks God is a hateful being, and I've just ruled his interpretation out, because it's a priori that um, you can't be a good being or a perfect being if you're hateful. How are you demonstrating that he's been deceived, though? Well, because I've got a sound ontological argument. No, how are you demonstrating that the guy has been deceived? He hasn't been deceived, he's just mistaken. Right, so I don't... His, his uh, interpretation I... is mistaken. That's what I've yeah, shown. But, yeah, but how have you how can you demonstrate that God didn't write a book that would generate such people after reading the book? Yeah, because then God would be a deceiver. Yeah, I don't see why. Well, but if that were true, God would be a deceiver, wouldn't he? But then he wouldn't be perfect. And I've got a sound ontological argument which shows that God possesses all perfections. But the thing is, is that there are theological name uh, aims, right, that God has and that he's trying to express in this book, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So I don't see how people interpreting the book such that they think that he's hateful uh, means that 
God is uh, actually uh, deceiving them if he wrote such a book that would generate such people. Well, because if God um, were to do that, that would be you know, lying to those people, right? He'd be a deceiver. I mean, the thing is, is that they've interpreted it that way, right? Yeah, they think that God is a hateful being. Uh, and why is it the case that if God writes a book that would make it so people have such a belief in order to meet theological aims, God would be deceiving them? Yeah, because then God would be lying about his character, right? That would be deceiving people. And I know about God's character because I've got a sound ontological argument. Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Yeah, I've got a sound ontological argument which shows that God is no deceiver. If these people's, inter if, um, if it were the case that God had, you know, like in this kind of skeptical theist way, um, written the Bible to mislead people for theological reasons, he'd be a deceiver. God is no deceiver, therefore that isn't true. Yeah, it just seems like then I would just say, I have a sound uh, argument to the ontological argument that shows that God can't be interpreted. Oh yeah, sure. If you have some kind of other, like, if you have a counter-argument to me, then we're just going to need to talk about that specific argument. Right, so appealing to that doesn't really seem to address the issue of interpretation right now. But it, but it does, because maybe my argument actually is sound. Maybe really when we look at the arguments for and against, turns out I've got a sound ontological argument. Yeah, but I can just say the same thing. You can say what you want. Response to, yeah, exactly. So, like, sticking to uh, trying to figure out how you would infer God's intentions. Right. Wait, Joe, that's not, that. that's kind of, like, I don't really see why that would be interesting. Anybody can say anything, right? The, the whole idea is what reason can, can I give, not um, whether I can rationally force people, that like, compel belief of people who disagree with me to accept my interpretation. I don't think that that's the, the right standard. Wait, that, that wasn't really under, are you saying... Yeah, I wasn't really understanding that. Well, what you, what you just said there is that you, as an atheist, could think that you had good arguments against the ontological argument. Now, that's just, why would that be interesting? So what? It might still be, you might just be thinking that, and it might still be that actually the balance of evidence goes in favor of the ontological argument. In which case, I would have a background belief on the table about God, which would rule out a particular interpretation of the Bible. Um, the, no, of course, the thing all is, of this... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's fine. Go ahead. Yeah, um, now, of course, all of this is contingent on whether my argument is actually good, right? If, if my argument isn't good, then it doesn't work. But let's just assume, would you, would you be willing to grant, if we assume that I have a sound ontological argument, I've just ruled out successfully one particular interpretation of the Bible, just, just a, a stipulating it for the sake of the argument. Yeah, but the thing is, is that what I'm stipulating and the reason why I gave the, the counter uh, is that it just seems like what I'm stipulating to you is that the, the Bible just can't be interpreted. Why? If, um, if God is no deceiver, then that means that we know that God isn't uh, uh, deceiving us when he wrote the Bible. And we know that he isn't a hateful being. We know that he's got to be all powerful. So when it says in the Bible... You know, that God is all powerful. We know that that's got to be true. I can. Does anyone? Well, that's mind just if I that's just in? kind of that's just kind of. Well, the thing is, is that if you're appealing to what's in the Bible, that would be back in the Bible. No, I didn't appeal to what's in the Bible. I appealed to my ontological argument, which is outside of the Bible. Well, obviously, if I just say the Bible says this, and then I just go from there, that's reasoning in a circle. That's not what I was trying to say. I mean, the thing is, is that you're saying that if by definition, right, God will uh, accurately, will write something such that he's accurately interpreted, then he'll be ac accurately interpreted. 
but that's not right. saying anything. But it is. I'm asking you to. I'm asking you, uh, like, what would justify, like, uh, what interpretive principles would you appeal to? But you're not appealing to any interpretive principles there. You're just saying he can be interpreted, and that's it. What I'm appealing to is background information that I have on God, which rules out certain interpretations of the Bible. I, I thought that that was the whole point. No, all you're saying, though, the background information that you're appealing to is just saying that God can be interpreted. No, that what I was appealing to was that God is a morally perfect being. Okay, so that's different from saying that he can be deceived, though. You know that, right? Um, well, no, because if like it's just known that you can't be perfect and be a deceiver, then I would know that God is no deceiver. Yeah, I don't see how... Um... Being morally perfect means that you can't deceive. Well, I'd say it's a priori and everybody already agrees with me. Uh, that's not an argument. Well, I kind of think it is an argument, right? I just, if I was, I just say it's just like two plus two equal four. This is just obvious and we all accept it. Right. So that's where it becomes an issue where you're just saying by definition he can be interpreted. No, what I'm saying is that, by definition, God cannot be a deceiver. Yeah, it just seems like you're saying that, by definition, this is the way that you can interpret the Bible. No, what I'm saying is that, by definition, like necessarily, God cannot tell lies. So we know that if somebody thinks that there's lies in the Bible, they're wrong. Right? That's, like, that's, one, in, that's one thing that I would be able to bring out of my argument. The thing is, like, the, the issue is that I don't see how that's entailed by saying that he's morally perfect. Well, because if he's morally perfect, he um, can't be a deceiver, because being a deceiver is an imperfection. Yeah, I don't see how that follows. Well, what I'd say to justify that is that it's a priori, and that we will accept it. It's just common sense. So, would you find it, uh, would you take it seriously if I just said it's common sense, the exact opposite? That if uh, God is morally perfect, then he would uh, deceive you? I'd, uh, I'd take a poll of the population and find out. You take polls on uh, things that are a priori? Yeah, well, if we want to find out whether something is common sense, we've got to take a poll on that. And and you you know as well as I know that most people think that lying is wrong that we should we, that we shouldn't lie generally speaking, right? That is common sense. What are you talking about? There's plenty of reasons where lying would be seen as morally good on people's standards of morality. Sure. So if you get if you um, say like uh, well maybe in this particular circumstance lying could be justified. Most people would agree that there are particular circumstances where lying could be justified. Exactly. But I think most people would, yeah, 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 I'm fine with that. But I think most people would say that lying itself is a bad thing to do. It's just that there could be re reasons to lie which overcame its uh, immorality. Yeah, there would be reasons God has to, uh, to like, even seem like he's lying in the Bible. But there That's couldn't be any reasons, with right? Me. But, but God can just produce whatever he wants, right? He doesn't need a reason to... It's not like he needs to um, rig the game in order to get what he wants, right? He can just create the world as he desires. Well, that's going to be a bigger issue. But the thing is, is that you're now, you do agree that you could have reasons to um, lie or deceive people. Um, a a non-omnipotent being could. But an, an, an omnipotent being can just produce what it is that they want. They can just produce the goal or the end, the um, means to the end, right? Why, why wouldn't lying be a part of that? Well, because we might lie um, if there's some kind of good reason to, right? Like if lying is going to save somebody's life. But God doesn't need to do that. God can just save somebody's life. He's omnipotent. 
he he doesn't need to inter um, you know play the game that way, right? He can just create or destroy as he sees fit. Yeah, I don't see why you would like how that follows. Like, I don't see why uh, why that would make it so you would have to narrow. You would make it so people who interpreted the Bible um, in a way that you think they're being deceived um, that wouldn't occur. God wouldn't deceive people with His Bible. Because he's morally perfect, and he couldn't have a reason to deceive people, because he could just produce whatever it was that he wanted. Well, then it seems like you're not going to be able to show that any interpretation obtains, because then it just seems like every single state of affairs would be consistent with God. Well, the, the interpretation that God is a morally perfect being obtains. No, that's already granted, though. Right, it's granted by the ontological argument, but it's also confirmed by the ontological argument. There are people who already have that interpretation without having an ontological argument on the table, and that interpretation would be confirmed by this argument that I've got. No, no, the thing is, is that people are trying to say their interpretation of God's utterances are correct, and you're granting god with certain attributes the problem is is that these people are unable to show how their interpretation is the accurate one the one that aligns with god's intentions yeah so i've got an argument to tell me uh, to inform me about certain attributes of god and those attributes that i know about confirm or disconfirm particular interpretations How would they, I mean, that's what I'm asking you. How, well, how because, are they confirmed in just well, we, We've got a guy who thinks that God is a hateful being, right? And we've just disconfirmed that. But we, uh, I don't see how that's, <laughs> we just went in a circle. And the issue is that if God's morally perfect, you agreed that there can be reasons that would uh, warrant lying. Yeah, but God wouldn't have any of those, right? He can just produce whatever it is that he needs to produce. He doesn't need to lie as a means to an end. He can just produce the end. What are you talking about? Well, yeah, like I said, we might lie in order to save somebody's life, because the only reason, the only way that we can save that person's life is by lying. But God doesn't have that. God has no limits. So he can just produce, he can just save that person's life without lying, right? So for him, it would always be wrong to lie. He would never have some kind of um, reason to lie, right? That would be the idea. That would be where I would go with this. Yeah, but it just seems like you're saying he is limited. You're saying that he can't lie in order to um, promote theological goals that he has. Yeah, well, because if he had a theological goal, he would just produce what it would, uh, what would satisfy that goal. Yeah, one one of the things would be lying. But that would be wrong for him to do, and there couldn't be any reason for him to lie. No, you said because he can just. You said there could be contexts, contexts where uh, lying would be justified. But it's not logically possible that God be in such a context. Now, just to be clear, I don't really think this is a very good argument, right? Like, I'm not persuaded by this, but I'm just trying to say what the theist, I'm just trying to imitate what the theist would say, okay? Now, now it sounded like earlier, I just want to get some information about this. It sounded like earlier you were kind of bringing up the Dekarshan demon, right? You were saying, well, what if God lied about whether he could lie? And what if God deceives you about whether he was a deceiver? Now, is, is the requirement for succeeding, for um, defeating the interpretation argument, that you have some kind of epistemic certainty about your interpretation, or do you just need it to be like you know, more rational than the other interpretations? It would be the latter, but I don't want you to think that it's as extreme as the Cartesian demon. The idea is like it seems like that people can generate interpretations, right? That uh, 
that talk about God lying or God that entail God's lying or being deceitful. And that doesn't seem like it would be inconsistent with the God that was proposed. Um, but it kind of would be, right? Because God is an omnipotent being. He could never find himself in a circumstance where he needed to lie to achieve some end. He can just produce the end. And God is no deceiver, right? He's morally perfect. Do you think that, that so you just think that it's impossible for there to ever be a circumstance where God would need to, where God would lie in order to um, promote a theological aim? Um, is it impossible? Um, yeah, I'm just going to say, I, I really don't know, but if I was a theist, I would just say, yeah, it's inconceivable that that could happen. Then I don't, I don't see how they would also. That seems to contradict them claiming that God is uh, all powerful. Well, where's the contradiction? Because it seems to me like a God that's all powerful would be able to uh, lie. Oh, not this, again. No, not, this old, not this old argument. They don't mean by omnipotence that God can do contradictions. No, I'm not saying contradictions. Well, if you're saying, you know, God's omnipotence should be able to just brute force his moral perfection such that he can lie, I, if I'm a theist, I'm just going to say, no, that's not what omnipotence means. Well, the, the issue that is... That sounded like what you were getting at. Well, the, the problem there is it seems weird to say that an omnipotent being itself can't lie because we can lie all the time. So you're appealing to, like, a God having limits relativized to his nature. And that creates a problem for saying that God is omnipotent too. But you're right, that is a completely other argument. Well, it's not just that he's omnipotent, he's also morally perfect. That's what the ontological argument shows. Right, but like, you, like uh, we agreed that uh, you can have states of affairs where lying would be the morally thing to do. Yeah, you can, if, if there's some kind of greater good that you can produce by lying, that can, it can be ethical to lie, but God can just produce the greater good because he's omnipotent. I mean, I would just say because he's omnipotent, he can lie in order to produce that greater good. No, that would be inconsistent. Why? Well, because God is a morally perfect being by definition. Okay, yeah. but you said that being morally perfect uh, doesn't deny the possibility of lying in order to do something wrong. But it does if you're omnipotent and morally perfect. Why? Because if God was omnipotent, he could just create whatever greater good there was that he wanted to create. But not if it... Um if he has to do so through lying. No, no because if he, it, there could never be a situation where he would have to lie. If there's a greater good that God wants to produce, he can just produce the greater good. There's no need for him to lie. So it would always be wrong for God to lie. You're just saying that you can't produce greater goods by lying. Well, it's just that God would never need to. Humans need to because we're not all powerful. It could just not be feasible for God to produce the greater good without lying, right? So like planting his says, for example. Yeah, I think if I was if I was a theist, I'd just say, no, that would just, even then it would just be contradictory for him to lie. And maybe my ontological argument shows that. But that, that would be a, a good place to go to, re, to replenish. Yeah, but I feel like this just like runs into the problem of evil then. Oh, I'm Leibniz. This is the best possible world. Dick, do you want to take over? Because I actually have to go. Oh, I don't. I don't. I'm not going to talk for that long, but I don't care. All right. Uh, do you want to talk about an interpretation argument later, though? Uh, ends up. Uh, well, when will you be back? Um. Probably not for a couple hours. Well, like, that was. That was. That was that was super vague. Um, so 
Probably not for like five hours. Uh, I'm probably going to be asleep by then. Um, but we can talk some other time. I definitely want to do it when it's not push to talk. So I'm fine with it being some other time. Okay. All right. Later. Okay, cool. Great uh, discussion, guys.